process and work around. Yes. This is the Perfect. Good afternoon, all, all. Hope you had a nice lunch, heavy lunch. So today, of course, I'm talking about marine heat waves, the new kind of heat waves, just like terrestrial heat waves, but over ocean. But also, I am taking you through a story on how, you know, some heat wave over ocean somewhere in the Bay of Bengal can reverberate, affect the atmosphere, change the atmospheric circulation, impact cyclones, and then carry that impact over to land, to what we call terrestrial heat waves. So you have been saying heat waves, heat waves, but I'm calling here terrestrial heat waves so as to differentiate between these heat waves over the ocean and over the land. Yeah. And this is a picture from those that one of the biggest terrestrial heat waves over land in the Indo Park region. In many of the early slides, you, you saw the heat wave over India, but heat wave doesn't stop with boundaries, it goes beyond boundaries. Yeah. What's that? And this is a heat wave like Dr. Ban was showing. A lot of people died during this heat wave, not only in India, but also in Pakistan as well. So these kind of some of these kind of heat waves are aggravated by other kind of yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Well, I'm fine. Perfect. So this is a study. Uh, done along with uh, my collaborators, Vineet Singh and Sharanya from who were in IATM until a few years back. And uh, Vineet is back here, he's a cyclone expert. Sharanya is a marine heat wave expert. So we have all these expertise together because this is a transdisciplinary study. So first let's get into what marine heat waves are, yeah. There are multiple definitions for marine heat waves. These are for surface marine heat waves. These are heat waves where extreme high temperatures in the ocean, when they exceed 90 percentile. So I will show you with this chart over here. I have made it simple. So this is a marine heat wave in 2020, April to May. So on the x-axis, you, you see the timeline, right? And on the y-axis, you are the temperatures from 28 to 32 degrees Celsius. And the average temperatures are in those green line. Yeah. And the real temperatures that we saw is in that black line, staggered line. And so, sorry, the average temperatures are in the blue line. And the green line shows the 90th percentile, above which you have the marine heat wave. All those red shaded area shows when we had this marine heat wave. So it's a marine heat wave which lasted for more than a month. And this is from Bay of Bengal, South Bay of Bengal region. And this is a spatial distribution. Over here, you can see the spatial distribution during this particular marine heat wave. So normally, the temperatures should be around 28 to 30 degrees Celsius, occasionally going up to 31. But you can see with the distribution during this particular marine heat wave, you have temperatures crossing to 31, 32, or 33 degrees Celsius over different parts of Bay of Bengal. Now, it doesn't stop there. These are estimates from satellite. What does in situ on site measurements show? This is from NAOT in Coes Buis from the same location in Bay of Bengal during the same April, May 20, uh, 2020. Yeah. You can see the temperatures going beyond 32, reaching up to 34 degrees Celsius. These are the highest recorded open ocean temperatures ever associated with a marine heat wave. Yeah. We have never seen temperatures going crossing 32, 
33 or reaching up to 34 degrees Celsius. Which also means we need better obs ocean observations. We need better monitoring like this if we need to capture these kind of marine heat waves because they are important for forecasting as well. Now, the same chart, but with superimposed with a cyclone happening by the uh, tail end of the marine heat wave. So after about one month of the marine heat wave, we had cyclone often around May 15. Yeah. So what we see is, we know, of course, sea surface temperature is one only one of the preconditions for cyclone formation and all. But generally, when you have uh, excessively warm temperatures, it provides additional source of heat and moisture for cyclones to develop and intensify. And that's what we see with these kind of cyclones preceding, preceded with marine heat waves. So you see uh, the temperatures, the temperature difference of about three degrees Celsius anomaly, and then you have a cyclone, the winds and the latent heat flux reduces the temperature to four degrees Celsius, it bounces back, still it reaches close to that marine heat wave signal, right? Now this is one cyclone, but we see that about 90% of the cyclones in the, uh, in the Bay of Bengal were preceded by marine heat waves. These are examples, I'm not showing all of the slides, but 2017, there were two cyclones, 2018, 2019, 2020, if you go back, you will see similar story for many of the cyclones in Bay of Bengal, preceded by marine heat waves. And this is a composite of sea surface temperatures preceding these cyclones. You see extremely high temperatures, 30, 31 uh, of uh, degrees Celsius sea surface temperatures. Similarly, if you take only the marine heat wave signal, that is above the 90th percentile, you would see that uh, strong warm anomalies over the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. So like I said, this, these are from those 90% of the cyclones preceding marine heat waves. So, and if, if you just pick the sea surface temperatures of these cyclones and put a time series over it, you would see that the temperatures, the average temperatures preceding those cyclones have gone up over time. You can see from around 29.5 degrees Celsius, the temperatures are reaching about 30 degrees Celsius, almost almost one degree Celsius change in average. Yeah. So the marine heat waves and the sea surface temperatures themselves have increased. So how does that affect the intensification of cyclones? There has been a study which is still in uh, uh, submission. So we show that in this study during pre-monsoon season, extremely warm temperatures, for example, in the Bay of Bengal, compared to, uh, you know, weaker sea surface temperatures. So this is a pre-monsoon season condition, usually during April, May. This is a post-monsoon season condition during, uh, after the monsoon, which is October, November. These are the two cyclone seasons. But when you have warm sea surface temperatures, because of the difference between the uh, surface layer and the lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere, there is a moisture disequilibrium and there is a high latent heat flux. All this results in a high updraft of moisture and heat to the upper level of the atmosphere. So generally, warm sea surface temperature, there is a strong updraft along with the cyclones. I'm not getting into the details of it, but you can see here between an earlier period and a later period with the same number of cyclones preceded by marine heat wave. So this is here the negative values. So this is uh, uh, if, uh, the orange line shows higher values of vertical velocity. This is the updraft in a cyclone, vertically up, going vertically up. So you would see compared to the earlier period, in the recent period, the updraft associated with these cyclones preceded by a marine heat wave are stronger. Here is a visual representation of that. Oh, Suppose you have a cyclone, tropical cyclone in the Bay of Bengal, you have a strong updraft, there is a vertical velocity. And where does it go? 
it ends with the earth flow in the upper atmosphere, upper troposphere, and then there is a subsidence somewhere else, right? So a cyclone is a strong, active, atmospheric uh, element which drives a, uh, I, I would say, medium-sized atmospheric circulation. And it results in a strong subsidence over a particular region. And that is the Indo-Pak region. To visualize that, this is over here. So this is the updraft outflow subsidence. So this is the same region where you see the blue shades indicates strong updraft, yeah, or omega. And the red region, this is where the subsidence is averaged over. You see all that region, including the Arabian Peninsula also. So what happens is that due to the subsidence of dry air, it results in an adiabatic compression and also more sunlight coming in because there are less clouds over there and it increases the shortwave radiation and enhances the heat over there, increasing the temperature over that region. And that is what you see in these composites for the same, uh, same set of cyclones preceded by marine heat waves. If you take the T mean, that's the mean temperature and the maximum temperatures, you will see high anomalies. The mean temperatures you would see, especially over the northwestern region, you will see temperatures going up to one degree Celsius and maximum temperature up to two, three degrees Celsius. And that is from the IMD data, the same thing. So because of the subsidence, and this is a indo Pak region where generally the air is subsiding, you have high temperatures, and on top of that, yeah, if you are a cyclone in the Bay of Bengal, or if you have marine heat wave leading to a cyclone in the Bay of Bengal, which intensifies the updraft, subsidence increases over the Northwest India Park region. Yeah, temperature increases in response to that, and you would see anomalies of two degrees Celsius or three degrees Celsius above the uh, normal heat or the temperatures. This is from, uh, I think, from crew surface temperature. You can see it's much more widespread. It doesn't stop with India and corresponds to this vertical velocity or the subsidence over that region, yeah, in response to this. And you would see similar subsidence over other regions also, the uh, Sumatran region, but the response in temperature is much lesser. There might be some other uh, <coughs> interacting elements over there. This is an example from one of the uh, cyclones. Uh, you would see along with after the subsidence, you know, there is in the below the troposphere at the lower troposphere, there are strong winds being pulled to the cyclone as well at the lower uh, troposphere. And these are the dry hot winds which are being pulled in, which extends that heat wave or the heat stress from Northwest India down south, down to Southeast. And you would see that these kind of uh, diagonal expansion of uh, heat is happening in the recent years, particularly with more and more cyclones. This is another case with the uh, Bay of Bengal cyclone Asani. Uh, you would see that there's a rainfall deficit also, which means there is more uh, dryness over these regions where the subsidence is and high temperatures going up to 46, 47 degrees Celsius during 12th May 2022. So this is from uh, IMD data itself. This is following cyclone Asani, a particular day uh, following cyclone Asani. Now, what does the future look like? Uh, we have uh, prepared a chapter on future projections of tropical Indian Ocean. It's getting published this month. Uh, which uh, talks about uh, how the uh, oceans are changing, particularly over the Indian seas, how the extremes are changing. And one of the key results are that those marine heat waves, which I showed in the first few slides, they are increasing further, the number of days. And that is what I'm showing here. So the number of days of marine heat waves, so if it was like on an average 50 days, in a year right now, it is going to be over 200 days. Whatever the scenario is, by around 2050, 2060, it is going close to be 
close to 200, 250 days, which is almost like Indian Ocean going into a permanent marine heat wave situation. Yeah. So that is the kind of feature that we are looking into, which means that we need to closely monitor these kind of marine heat waves. If you want to understand how the oceans are changing, how it is affecting our atmospheric events, and also how it is affecting the heat waves over land as well. Yeah. So that is the message that I want to tell you. And you saw that in that buoy mooring data that all marine heat waves are not well observed, right? We need to closely observe them so that we can forecast these events better. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. We can take one question if. Uh... Okay. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. You can use the mic so yeah. that. Uh, you showed us air subsidence thing. Now, yeah. suppose it's happening in Bay of Bengal. Yeah. Recently, we've also seen where we have twin cyclones. Yeah. One also. Yeah. yeah. What happens? Have you started what happens then with this whole air subsidence? If you have both in Arabian Sea, one cyclone formation, and maybe one in Bay of that's, Bengal. That's quite interesting. I haven't even thought about that. I am sure the uh, area of subsidence will change. Or uh, uh, I don't know really how, how they will overlap and affect it. Yeah. But I have seen that uh, even with uh, different cyclones in the Bay of Bengal, the area of subsidence is slightly here and there. Because cyclone formation also is different at different locations. They move in a different direction and their intensity is also different. Yeah. To an average, you would see a kind of subsidence like that over there. And you, had, you saw that over Sumatra also, there is some other subsidence. Yeah. So for Arabian Sea also, we are expecting it to have a, a subsidence in some locations. We haven't explored it. And twin cyclone, it's a quite interesting to explore. Thanks for that idea. Uh, uh, sir, so you talked about that vertical velocity plot uh, yeah. during the Amphan cyclone. Yeah. So uh, always uh, there is not cyclone associated with this when no, we are mining. No. Yeah. So during those days when there are no cyclones, huh. is uh, the updraft is similar uh, like this or during the times of marine heat waves? It's, it's potentially, I mean, it should enhance the convection definitely. There should be some kind of uh, similar compensating uh, subsidence, maybe not at this level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is, that's also something we can explore. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So the next presentation will be from Professor Joy Montero from ISAR and uh, he will probably present comprehensive picture of heat health and something like that. Or, yeah. Or. Thank you, Dr. Sahai. Uh, hello, everyone. I've, I I know this is a symposium on the science of heat waves, but I want to present something that is not so much uh, related to science alone, uh, with the hope that uh, thinking about the same problem in different ways can help inform our science and ask uh, help us ask different kinds of questions, which I think becomes very important when you're trying to uh, look at adaptation related issues. Uh, so I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this sort of a plot, uh, which, uh, yes. So you have risk due to heat waves. Uh, it is not equal to how many heat waves occur, right? So this is uh, just one part of it. We also have some parts of it which are not really uh, climate science. Uh, and we need to uh, keep that in mind when talking about risk. So uh, what I want to sort of drive home in terms of uh, thinking points to think about today 
uh, are are these three questions, right? So if you're talking about heat waves, uh, how do you measure heat waves? Uh, and for whom are you measuring? Because we're thinking about it in terms of uh, some stakeholder. And for what purpose is it being measured? Ah, OK. Uh, so the big question, right? Uh, we are all climate scientists. We know more about the hazard, right? How do you measure the hazard? So it's not like this is a solved problem, right? Uh, there have been papers uh, written by climate scientists themselves on how do you measure heat waves. So you are all probably familiar with these kind of metrics. So should you use daily maximum? Should you use daily minimum? Uh, should you use excess heat factor, which is again uh, being used uh, very often? Uh, there is no reason or there is no consensus about which one to use. And uh, what I'm again trying to say is this depends on for what purpose are you measuring heat waves. There must be a reason why you're measuring heat waves, and that should decide how you want to measure the hazard. So uh, I'll give you uh, a, a, an example, uh, which has probably been in the literature for the past 10 years. It's a very hot topic nowadays. The latest IPCC report talked about it. Uh, the big difference between dry and humid heat waves, right? Uh, Everybody is now talking about wet bulb temperatures. So the, the first paper to really bring forth uh, the possibility that there is uh, some issue uh, that is related to humidity and which we need to keep in mind uh, is this paper around 2010. And uh, a lot of papers which followed this essentially used wet bulb temperatures. Uh, as a way to measure the hazard. And they called those humid heat waves. And uh, others who were measuring heat waves using uh, regular air temperature called it dry heat waves. Right? Uh, so if we measure them in these ways, uh, which one is more useful? right? Uh, but one point from the climate science side is these two have very different mechanisms. Uh, and that's what I want to uh, show here. So this is a study we did uh, in uh, this region of Pakistan, Sindh, uh, which is known to have some of the highest uh, wet bulb temperatures globally. Uh, and the main takeaway from here I want uh, to show you is this is the wet bulb anomaly, wet bulb temperature anomaly. So you see that there is a heat wave right, with respect to wet bulb temperatures. But if you look at the corresponding temperature anomaly, it's almost close to zero. right? So you have a wet, humid heat wave, but not a dry heat wave. Okay? And these two things, which is why I pointed out that they occur due to very different mechanisms themselves. To have a humid heat wave, you need to bring in a lot of water vapor uh, from a very moisture-rich source, which here was happening from uh, the Arabian Sea. Uh, whereas that is not at all a requirement uh, for a dry heat wave. Uh, there is another important thing to keep in mind that the minute you put water vapor very close to the surface, you create a very unstable atmosphere. Therefore, how long can you sustain a humid heat wave is also a big question. And uh, there have been papers recently which were uh, attributing uh, a lot of the high impact heat waves uh, to the fact that they were humid, right? There was both increased temperature and humidity. So we actually tried to uh, investigate that question. And we looked at some of the big high impact heat waves. One of them was what uh, Roxy mentioned, the 2015 heat wave. And we looked at uh, station data from uh, Andhra Pradesh, because Andhra Pradesh had some uh, a lot of mortality. And the red band is when the uh, mortality was recorded. Uh, and the blue curves are uh, daily minimum. Uh, of wet bulb temperature, and uh, uh, the this line is daily maximum wet bulb temperature, and the dashed ones are air temperature, daily maximum, daily minimum. So you see that in four coastal stations, uh, except for Vishakhapatnam, almost all of them showed no increase in the daily maximum wet bulb temperature. Uh, whereas you see that there was a huge dip in the daily minimum wet bulb temperature. So you are actually removing heat, uh, water vapor, uh, from that area. 
from a very humid area. So you, you know it's a humid area. So you would expect somewhat intuitively that there was high humidity and high heat. But in fact, that is not true. We did this analysis for many other heat waves uh, which were high impact in South Asia. And the same picture comes about that even in a humid area when you have a high impact heat wave, it's actually reducing uh, water vapor. And it's not really a humid heat wave in that sense. Right? Of course, there's always this caveat if this is for the current climate. Uh, but we don't expect this to change uh, dramatically for fundamental reasons uh, with regards to the depth of the boundary layer and how it changes uh, during the heat wave. And if you look at a global analysis, uh, uh, so I, I'm just putting the screenshot of the paper so that if you take a photo, you can always go back and refer. So this paper looked at what is the overlap between dry heat waves and humid heat waves globally using ERA-5. And you see that for the majority of the globe, the overlapping ratio is close to zero. And it's definitely true for uh, India and South Asia as well. So now you want to measure the hazard. And you say you want to use red bulb temperatures. But you're measuring a completely different hazard than if you had used dry bulb temperatures. Okay? So this is one uh, way of uh, looking at the problem. Another way is, OK, let's do a more impact-oriented analysis. right? So let us measure heat waves as the extreme of some uh, biophysically relevant indicator. For example, uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, heat stress indices, uh, which many of you may be familiar with. right? And this paper uh, essentially looked at all uh, available uh, indicators that exist in the literature between 200 BC and 2980. Uh, and it turns out there are uh, 232, uh, I'm sorry, there were 340 of them, uh, of which 187 can be calculated using meteorological parameters. So you have 180 ways of measuring the hazard. right? So which one do you use? right? And if you notice that these uh, indicators they are developed for people who are active, who are, which are some of them are eligible for occupational settings. So they have very uh, have some underlying assumptions. So it is not as if I decide, okay, today I'm going to start measuring using the heat index, and that's actually going to be meaningful, or I'm going to use WBGP, that is going to be meaningful. There is no reason for us to believe that any single index that you use will actually have a direct correlation with the impacts that you want to measure. And coming to the second question uh, of exposure, right? So exposure is a more person-centric. So how much am I exposed to? So for instance, outdoor versus indoor. Exposure is completely different because you don't have radiation, particularly. And there could also be very different levels of temperature and humidity, uh, outdoor and indoor. And a more important question, especially from uh, the point of view of impacts, is how much of exposure is unacceptable, right? This is also not, doesn't have a universal answer, right? For what kind of a person are you talking about? I'll give some examples, but I just want to lay the questions out, right? For what reason are you measuring this exposure, right? Are you measuring someone who's working, who's exercising? Do you want to measure the impacts in terms of morbidity or you want to measure in terms of mortality, right? These are all very important questions that have to be kept in mind when you're designing your research. So uh, just to give you an example, uh, this was a very recent paper uh, that came out, which was using uh, survivability uh, as an impact. Right? Can you possibly survive in an environment? And you see, already there are differences, whether you're young or whether you're old, uh, whether you're indoor uh, or whether you're outdoor. So the amount of temperature and humidity that you can tolerate uh, is very clearly linked to what kind of exposure and to what kind of setting you are coming from. And uh, if you want to look at, for instance, uh, not at mortality, survivability is more about, okay, I'm going to not be able to survive at all. Let's say we are more interested in our ability to work, right? So physical work capacity. 
So for instance, this is the wet bulb temperature again. So we will see that roughly around 25 degrees wet bulb temperature, your ability to work almost reduces by half. Right? So if your concern is to be able to predict and forecast hazard uh, for the reasons of uh, telling a person how long can you work in such an environment. You normally have an eight hour work shift, but you can probably just work four hours right now, or you have to take a break every hour. Right? So that kind of a, uh, advice to give needs a very different approach uh, to the problem. And the measurement problem keeps coming up over and over. And I just want to highlight this in, in terms of exposure. So these are two papers, and they're essentially talking about uh, uh, this issue in depth, right? So you have many commonly used indices, like the ones we all of us who do research into this field commonly use, and they disagree on the effect of moisture. For instance, heat index versus wet bulb temperature versus WBGT, right? They all give completely different uh, values. Similarly, the amount of work you can do depends on what metric you use. So I will quickly wrap up, but uh, what I'm uh, showing is the high exposure depends on how you choose. So we used uh, a, a survivability-based threshold, and you can see it highlights in different months the exposure is high in different parts of South Asia. And not just in different parts, but even what hour of the day so very often, public health messaging says, stay out, stay indoors during the hottest times of the day. But what we uh, showed using uh, 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 exposure metric, which is relevant to health, is that even if you look at 6 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, you are still uh, experiencing hazardous levels of heat. Vulnerability is something that I won't go into because I'm not an expert. There are probably much better people in the audience to describe this. But I, I want to point out this one paper, which I think uh, all uh, everyone who works in this field must read, that vulnerability does not fall from the sky. Right? There is no such thing as a universal vulnerability. And it depends on biophysical characteristics. It also depends on social characteristics, socioeconomic characteristics. And it can change risk by changing hazard levels. Something that is hazardous for an old person need not be hazardous for a young person, and so on. And this is an important figure from that paper. So very often when we do an analysis of impacts and vulnerability, we use this framework. right? So there is a drought. There is a heat wave. Uh, what does it cause? right? So all the dose response uh, curves that we can compute you the epidemiological work that happens in uh, our field uh, is in this area. But to be able to actually formulate policy, this is the kind of analysis that is needed. This is the kind of response you're looking for, not just one. But you see that from loss of livelihood being one impact, environmental variability becomes one cause. Right? And this shift in the way you look and define uh, vulnerability is essential to be able to communicate this at a policy level. So I will conclude. These are the main points that I wanted to bring across. That measurement of hazard and exposure is a very fundamental problem and it must be addressed whenever we do research. There cannot, I mean, this is more controversial, but I, I will be willing to debate on it, that there cannot be a single heat wave index that is suitable for everyone and for all applications. I, I don't, I think we should move away from that kind of a thinking system. And when we're designing heat health early warning systems, you should be able to clearly answer the questions. For whom do you want to give warnings? And for what purpose do you want to give the warnings? And vulnerability analysis is very important for adaptation because it can inform policy which can give long-term changes. Uh, and therefore, for adaptation, uh, we need to keep vulnerability in the forefront as much as we are worrying about how heat waves are going to change with climate. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Thank you. So if there are any quick questions, please. This is just a compliment. Actually, I find you know in a different way and a very most honest way of presentation how we can approach to our heat action plan. Thank you. It's just a compliment. Okay. Uh, yeah. I just wanted
Thank you. Thank you for this lecture. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, you identified some areas for he uh, wet heat waves, uh, moist heat waves rather. Uh, can you please tell me the wet belt temperature range that it reaches in those areas? Uh, uh, I, I mean, it was about 31. I do remember that. I don't remember the exact numbers about 31. Okay, now 33 is a value that we normally people have come to now take as above the, that being it is dangerous. Okay, 31 is pretty comfortable, so to say. It is not. But okay. <laughs> no, we, the recent uh, mappings have been done for uh, nobody has complained in the Indian regions for that. So it's very critical to see uh, the wet heat waves are very uh, difficult to control. Mind you, uh, we should never uh, underestimate them. Because the body will never cool unless you go under an AC. Yeah. You can provide the minerals and you can recharge the body when it is a dry heat wave. The other way around, people must know that it is really dangerous. So sure. let's not underestimate it. Okay. I, I fully agree. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. So uh, now I hand over the mic to Dr. Sushmita. Thank you, sir. So now uh, we will move on to the next uh, speaker from CDAC, Dr. Sahidul Islam, on HPC enabled urban integrated modeling challenges and solutions. Uh, hello, yeah, so uh, this particular presentation is not uh, related to any uh, heat wave condition, but uh, it's a, one of the important topic for uh, any uh, heat, wave, uh, heat wave related research. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for uh, giving opportunity to uh, us. Uh, uh, basically, this particular presentation is uh, prepared by all these uh, people. Uh, I am only on behalf of them. I am only presenting. Uh, um, so uh, this is uh, the uh, model, uh, the integrated modeling part. We are working for a project uh, uh, with some consortia partners. Uh, we'll just discuss more of these details. So uh, the uh, outlines like this, I uh, will show you some uh, background and then challenges for the modeling, or I, I would say the uh, urban integrated modeling uh, challenges, uh, then uh, uh, how we have developed the different couple model uh, for that uh, things we'll discuss and then we'll come up with some. So as uh, you know that uh, this is very uh, uh, straightforward things that uh, the uh, city's growth is increasing every, every day. So how these things will be impacted our uh, daily life, uh, that is one of the uh, in terms of the environmental issues come to the development. So uh, we will be discussing on that uh, point and then and then the, this this environmental issues, how we can integrate with different uh, uh, areas of uh, exploration. So uh, you know that uh, there are gaps in terms of the uh, uh, data information which is available uh, in, across the different uh, areas and it is lying in different silos. So can we integrate in those data set in a particular platform, uh, we are, uh, uh, these are things we are currently uh, lacking. Uh, and then the, the, this, uh, the interoperable data format, which is like you now different uh, data having different types of formats. So can we make a, some kind of uh, platform where these data can be easily uh, you know, uh, converted into as per the uh, requirement of different users or uh, researchers. And uh, there are uh, things that which require by the different users, uh, citizen centric uh, requirements, which are mostly used by different users and different kind of formats they could have. So our particular effort is to put those uh, requirements in the particular platform. And yes, it to involve different uh, stakeholders, users onto that. And uh, we have uh, also uh, one of the... 
uh, one of the important thing is that uh, we are preparing a standard operating procedure for this uh, all these data sets and modeling and different uh, 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 DSS I used the decision support system uh, to uh, avoid the duplication of different uh, uh, researchers. So uh, what are the uh, different uh, challenges for the uh, urban modeling research? Uh, uh, you know that uh, different kind of uh, uh, things is required to do all these cross sectors modeling things. Uh, because uh, uh, some of the people are doing survey only for weather research, uh, some are doing uh, meteorological research, or, I mean, hydrological research, uh, then some are doing air quality. So, all these factors can be uh, integrated in a uh, things uh, which are uh, usually uh, doing by the different uh, researchers. Uh, but it is not, uh, we do not have any, you know, some kind of uh, integrated platform where all these thing, things can be at a time can be viewed. So, these uh, things uh, well, and then different data acquisition parts also uh, coming in nowadays different uh, data set come in very huge form so uh, though those data set has to be you know easily accessible by the users so that we are making and uh, uh, another another thing that uh, we have also uh, developed uh, some kind of uh, cloud uh, form where we can all these data set can be accessed by the different users uh, in a, in a, in a, uh, some registered kind of users so and then uh, the visualization part also is you okay yeah so uh, this visualization part also one of the important part because lots of data is creating uh, uh, so can we have a some kind of you know automatic kind of visualization part where the students or users can easily view that uh, data sets so uh, with that uh, um, problems and challenges we have uh, uh, we have uh, we have put an effort to uh, study the interdisciplinary uh, researches like you know whether uh, hydrology or air quality and uh, computation application. So, uh, this is uh, uh, started, uh, we have to started this in 2018. Uh, I think recently, uh, I, WM also started this uh, 2019 for this um, inter interdisciplinary work. And uh, under the, this NSM project, we are uh, creating a uh, urban environmental science to society kind of environment where all these uh, components can be, uh, can be run or can be visualized uh, as per the users. And uh, this, uh, when you are running in an urban environment, you need to have a some kind of a prediction system where all these urban uh, processes can be easily resolved. And uh, we are also creating a some kind of HPC-based uh, uh, science cloud platform, platform where the uh, students or researcher can access the HPC platform to execute their models. Uh, uh, it's mostly the uh, uh, free of cost kind of thing. So this will help to the different research in terms of the modeling and technology development because uh, uh, this thing uh, we uh, as, as I said that this partners partnership we have prepared with uh, different uh, uh, CDAC uh, then ISC Bangalore, uh, IIT Pune area air quality and ISC Bangalore for hydrology and uh, uh, this uh, IIT Bhubanesh with uh, for their uh, meteorological research. So all these uh, things uh, we have uh, interdisciplinary things we have created and then. Uh, different users, different different collaborators. We have uh, worked with this, and we have framed at this uh, this particular uh, modeling, urban modeling project. So uh, all these uh, uh, par partners will be working with the different uh, uh, kind of problems, and then uh, our work will co collate those uh, uh, you know, outputs or parameters and to visualize in their different kind of form, uh, which is required by the different users. So uh, the like uh, no, the, the meteorology component uh, will be done by uh, IC, uh, IIT Bhubaneswar. They will work on the different uh, urban uh, model configuration and this thing. This is uh, then hydrology also will drive by uh, by IC only from Professor Mujumdar team and then air quality we are working with IIT uh, Dr. Sachin and then the assimilation part we are working with uh, the, this uh, SAC Amdavar. So this will all will be integrated together and we have uh, we have. Uh, publish a very uh, interesting paper in uh, uh, BMS uh, journal, uh, you can uh, go through it. So uh, the basic philosophy behind was that uh, the researcher should do the basic research and then they come out with some solution in, in terms of the uh, uh, research outcome and then uh, we do those outputs should be uh, visualized into a, a cyber infrastructure framework and then uh, this, this, this data can be uh, used for different uh, services. Uh, uh, we are creating uh, this particular framework in such a way that uh, this is will be some kind of uh, semi-operational or uh, no, uh, operational kind of thing can be uh, readily done. 
so uh, there will be very less uh, manual intervention onto it uh, so that you know researcher uh, can do easily their output can easily show and see the difference between the uh, different solution they come up with that uh, this is uh, one of the uh, the when we are uh, when we are trying to do the simulation uh, for uh, rainfall and we observe that uh, especially for pune city uh, this is a hilly uh, hilly, um, uh, lots of hills are around so um, uh, we have to come up with some some kind of uh, domain experiments because placing of the domain is very important uh, this was uh, initially we started when we were working with the uh, late uh, dr shikta sir uh, that time uh, you were uh, mentioning this uh, domain uh, placing of the also also very important for any uh, rainfall simulation so we have tried with this thing uh, placing of the domains and we could able to uh, simulate the cases uh, uh, rainfall heavy rainfall cases and uh, we could able to uh, know, uh, prepare this domain for the different, different uh, areas. Uh, because uh, we are working in the different cities like you know, Pune, Bangalore, Bhubaneswar, they all sit in different uh, climate characteristics. So uh, we need to consider those characteristics in such a way that uh, all these uh, domains can also play, play a significant role for while capturing the uh, rainfall events. So we have carried out different sensitivity experiments for those uh, um, cities, and uh, we came up with some uh, uh, solution or some some kind of uh, physical evaluation scheme set up. And uh, we are uh, we are running this uh, model with uh, this 4.5 kilometer for a for a city region. We are running with 0.5 kilometer because when we are running with uh, 1.5 or 0.5 kilometer, it requires some kind of you know, um, uh, it, it improves uh, the surface uh, processes uh, capturing. So that way, uh, this is worked well for us. And uh, this can be uh, when you are uh, for, for all the students who can carry out the research, uh, they should also you know um, uh, may apply this kind of approach to find out the uh, what is the optimal uh, uh, domain setup. Uh, then, uh, as I said, that we are working on the different um, uh, cities. Uh, These cities requires uh, very high resolution uh, land use land cover data, and it requires. Uh, very, uh, we are we have created uh, this land use land coded with 10 meter resolution so that you now all these processes can be uh, ingested into the model and we could able to uh, create a, uh, this kind of uh, land use land cover map over the city and uh, we could able to ingest into the model and we have seen the significant improvement in the uh, model uh, prediction system. Um, then we have also worked on the uh, different uh, uh, initial conditions for the uh, uh, model installation. <coughs> this uh, um, we use uh, NSEP uh, GFS and the IMD GFS. Uh, IMD GFS uh, is uh, uh, definitely better than the uh, other one. And uh, then uh, once we improve this uh, um, initial condition, then uh, in the LULC of over the city, we have simulated. One case, uh, there are many cases, one, one case only I am presenting over, over here. So one of the cases where uh, there have been very heavy rainfall and some kind of flooding condition situation was there at that time. So uh, one of the cases uh, with this uh, setup, we could able to simulate uh, the, the rainfall cases uh, very significantly and uh, it has given uh, a lot of improvement in the data. And these data uh, also used for the, um, uh, for the hydrological simulations. Similar to that, uh, similar setup, we also work for the uh, Pune city, but no, in these cases, uh, the, uh, the rainfall is not much improved. So uh, that are the uh, things we observe. Uh, we are working on it, how to improve further on this. Uh, uh, that is uh, where we are working on this, and uh, probably we'll come up with some solution on this. And uh, since, uh, since we are working on the uh, 1.5 kilometer, 0.5 kilometer, yeah, we just wanted to check whether uh, the whether this uh, 0.5 kilometer or 500 meter resolution is giving any uh, no improvement in terms of the uh, uh, forecast. So uh, we have seen that uh, 0.5 kilometer definitely improved the uh, uh, improved the uh, forecast, and uh, because you now we have improved the uh, initial condition, IMDGFS we are using also we are using the high resolution uh, land use land cover map over the city. So it has improved the uh, improvement on this rainfall cases. Yeah, so in that uh, we have seen that uh, there are less uh, false alarm, uh, alarm also, and then uh, more accuracy we observed.
So we have uh, also uh, developed an uh, integrated couple model. Uh, we have uh, developed the hydrology model uh, and the weather uh, forecast model, WRF and uh, different hydrology models we have uh, coupled. And it is a, uh, some kind of uh, online coupled model uh, where uh, the data comes from the uh, weather model and uh, as a rainfall and it goes, goes to uh, hydrology models. And uh, you convert these uh, data, um, the grid data into the hydrology data, um, format data and then uh, give the forecast for different uh, city, uh, different areas of uh, cities. Uh, we mostly give the uh, word-wise uh, uh, forecast for hydrology um, uh, related uh, information. And why we also indicated, since we know that we have different um, dams across our cities, uh, we also indicated that dams operations uh, and then uh, whenever, whenever there is a heavy rainfall also in, uh, no, uh, releasing the water from dams. So how these two things come together, uh, planted the our uh, cities, that also we uh, uh, done. Uh, for that, uh, one of the cases uh, we have uh, seen that, uh, no, the, uh, we have simulated the cases and we have seen that uh, what are the, uh, compare the ground to thing, to thing also and then see how this our model is performed and in this case, uh, really it has improved our the model uh, and we, uh, since uh, this rainfall forecast is, you know, we are getting around 70% accuracy, probably we have, we have uh, more accuracy, probably this may improve uh, further. Uh, another thing that we also coupled models uh, we are doing with uh, IITM Pune. Uh, where the, as you know that we are with, uh, IITM having a very good setup for Delhi. Uh, we are also uh, no, doing the similar thing for different other cities uh, with the with the help of data uh, Because uh, nowadays uh, all other cities also um, uh, affecting the Pune uh, I mean air quality conditions. Right uh, this is another important thing that uh, when you are working with uh, pollution, uh, we some uh, identified different hot spots over a particular uh, junction, and then how this pollution is uh, now moving around the city uh, that we are uh, coupled with the uh, composition fluid dynamics of the model. And uh, the, the, the sad part is that uh, now for 24 hour simulation, it takes around 36 hour of competitive time, which is you now we are working on it how to improve further on this uh, uh, in terms of the simulation. Another important that uh, we are also created some kind of uh, study in the uh, urban heat island. Um, that is also uh, also one of the outcome of this uh, collaborative effort. Effort. And we have also created some web-based uh, applications where you know um, uh, researcher can or students can access the uh, access the um, uh, our SPG servers and then submit their different uh, uh, applications. As I know in the report, this is uh, uh, will be releasing uh, very soon, uh, probably in the month of June. And then uh, users or uh, students can access this thing, uh, this portal, and they can submit their jobs in different applications like um, uh, weather, uh, flood, or air quality. So these are the models uh, we, uh, we have integrated uh, this this uh, in this uh, integrated platform. Uh, user can uh, submit or you know uh, use this um, modeling system and then uh, do their research. Please wrap uh, yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. I'll not uh, discuss about this uh, compilation part. Uh, yes, uh, see, as a CDAC, we are doing a lot of compilation optimization. Uh, you can see this uh, total time is uh, reduced as, uh, you know, uh, from 372 to 245. This optimization part also we are uh, doing. So, uh, just this. I think. Uh, uh, these are my uh, collaborators and we are acknowledging this uh, effort and they have uh, helped a lot on this during this uh, research and uh, because of their contribution we could able to uh, uh, create this type of framework. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, since we are a bit late, we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Bhubendra Singh from IITM Pune. He'll be talking on the soil moisture induced land atmosphere interactions in the involution of extreme temperature over India.
am I audible? Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. So today I would be very briefly discussing about the impact of soil moisture on on the evolution of temperature extremes in India. And uh, this is the outline of my talk. I will skip this. Yeah. So coming to the soil moisture, the, it is actually the presence of water in the unsaturated zone of soil, which is we know, uh, which is known as the Vador zone. And uh, the important thing is it acts as a storage component for uh, precipitation and radiation anomalies. Uh, yeah. So uh, by by that uh, by that virtue, it actually induces persistence in the in the climate system that we also know know in the terms of soil moisture memory in the system. And uh, so uh, so one of the very important uh, aspects of soil moisture is uh, it, it it acts very significantly in in the land water balance wherein it can help partition the received precipitation in uh, evaporation the surface runoff the drainage and the layer layer water content and again coming to the uh, uh, energy balance at the surface it helps partition the energy received at the surface the radiational energy into the latent heat flux and the and the uh, turbulent sensible heat flux the ground heat flux and the layer heat content so, so, so we will we will come to that aspect later. So, the the important aspect is the uh, the partition partitioning of net radiation into the latent heat flux and the and the sensible heat flux. How it can govern the evolution of temperature extremes in India. Uh, uh, coming to the effect of uh, soil moisture on temperature variations. In fact, the one of the classical papers by Delworth and Manabe first introduced this concept. So what they did, they conducted some model sensitivity experiments in, in which, in one case, they intro, introduced the soil wetness, but it was not interacting with the atmosphere. In another case, they, they introduced the soil wetness and it was kept interacting with the atmosphere. So the thing is, if you see clear, uh, 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 clearly, in the summer hemisphere, the June, July, August month, if you see, the zonal mean variance of temperature in case of interactive soil wetness is much more relatively if you see in winter hemisphere the changes are not i mean uh, from interactive to interactive the changes are not prominent but the mean variation variation itself is quite high so so this actually indicate uh, this actually generated a lot of interest in in the role of soil moisture in governing the temperature extremes uh, and 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 uh, of course, the response varies with the uh, latitude. I mean, when you go from the lower latitudes to the to the higher latitudes in the in the northern hemisphere, so you see the response varies. But most of the uh, effects actually comes from the low latitude to mid latitudes. Yeah. So so this study was mostly concerned about the global picture. Now coming to the regional context, the processes become much more complex. So. Uh, yeah, so there are plenty of studies which have highlighted that the uh, there has been increase in the number of hot days and uh, heat wave frequency, heat wave duration have increased and, and the reasonings have been shown to uh, to be the formation of persistent mid troposphere high or the uh, presence of anticyclone, the depleted soil moisture and clear sky conditions. So. One of the studies by Senevratne et al. They identified the global hot spots of soil moisture temperature coupling during boreal summer months. And if you see the the major monsoon dominated regions of the globe are actually the the hot spots of soil moisture temperature coupling, in which India also uh, resides at, at at a significant position. Now, through our sustained observations at IITM site and through other observational products of soil moisture. We we we, uh, we we sort of know that there exist seasonal variations, strong seasonal significant variations in the soil moisture within seasons and even in the in the uh, sub seasonal scales. And and now we wanted to know how it actually shapes the evolution of temperature extremes. So for that, we conducted some sensitivity experiments using MRI AGCM 3.2 and specifically focused on on uh, the Indian continent. And we conducted uh, we conducted um, uh, control historical and future simulations. And then we perturbed the soil moisture by minus 20% and increased the soil moisture by plus 20%. And why this 
only 20% this also came from the observational knowledge because through our sustained observations what we observed that during different years and during different seasonal transitions the changes in the upper soil moisture content ranges between around 20% the the upper end is close to 20% so that's why we force the model with uh, with uh, these kind of settings and then we examined the extreme temperature characteristics so so before before coming to the uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, results so one one term that is that highlights the the effect of soil moisture on temperature is the coupling strength so we followed the criteria by dirmeyer et al and what we found was even in the historical climate and in the future climate these are the zones where you see a strong effect of soil moisture on temperature of course other in other areas also it is there but but the strong uh, zone of uh, coupling exists in these these locations so now uh, as many of other speakers have highlighted it actually depends on how we are uh, defining the thresholds in this study we adopted this uh, approach uh, the extreme temperature event was defined as the daily t maximum value uh, at each grid point which was greater than 90th percentile uh, computed from of course the historical experiment of the corresponding day and it persists for at least 3 days now total number of extreme temperature events per year we define as the extreme temperature frequency index total number of days in each such event was defined as the extreme temperature duration index and extreme temperature intensity was the uh, measure of maximum uh, t max for each year at the grid point now uh, so so the extreme temperature frequency in the historical control simulation if you see was like close to 4 to 5 events per um uh, per year which actually goes pretty high in the in the in the future climate like uh, close to 14 15 so every 25 to 30 days you can expect uh, the the um, uh, extreme temperature events now coming to the um, sensitivity experiment so the the left panel is actually in the historical control simulation and the the middle one is the in, uh, what are the changes noted in the dry simulation you see it is minus historical simulation and then what happens in the wet wet simulation so what we observed in historical experiments on an average if we force it with drier soil moisture conditions it tends to increase the extreme temperature frequency by almost 4 to 5 events per year extreme temperature uh, 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 duration by 1 to 2 days per event and long term mean extreme temperature intensity by at least point close to 0.6% uh, 0.6 degrees celsius and then uh, in case of wet soil uh, moisture conditions it tends to reduce the extreme temperature frequency by uh, 1 to 2 events uh, uh, per year and uh, the duration by 2 to 3 days per event and uh, the extreme temperature intensity by point almost 0.5 uh, degrees celsius now this is this this highlights the changes in in the future climate of course for the uh, two uh, sensitivity simulations also so the uh, the simulation actually shows that the dry in case of dry simulation you intensify the extreme temperature frequency by 1 to 2 events per year and in which you have an increase of 0 to 1 day per event and long term mean intensity by almost 1 degree celsius as compared to the future control run now in case of increase in soil moisture by 20% in future so it indicates a reduction of extreme temperature frequency by close to 3 to 4 events per year and extreme temperature days reduced by 3 to 4 days per event and long term mean uh, intensity reduces by 2 degree celsius now a close comparison between the historical and future climate if you apply these kind of sensitivity experiments we see that almost 70% of the indian landmass is expected or has experienced significant change in extreme temperature uh, characteristics that may have been modulated by the soil moisture so coming to the results over the uh, strong coupling zone which we identified through a through a box in 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 the previous uh, slide so here if you see the uh, the um, uh, white white uh, uh, bars actually highlight the extreme temperature frequency the light gray bars uh, indicate the duration and the uh, dark gray, uh, gray bars indicate the intensity so you can see uh, uh, an increase of almost 5 extreme temperature frequency events per year over north central india from the historical minus 20 experiment wherein you see an increase of uh, duration by 1.8 days 
and an increase in intensity by 0.71 degrees Celsius. In case of wet simulation, the historical uh, climate shows the event reduces by three events per year and duration by one day per event and the long term mean by almost close to 1.9 degrees Celsius with respect to the historical experiment, wherein in the future you, say, uh, you, you see a relatively moderate change as compared to the historical climate, wherein you, the, the dry simulation shows an increase in uh, uh, frequency by 2.2 to uh, 2 .2 events per year and duration by 1.6 days per event and uh, the change in intensity by close to 0.9. And whereas in the wet simulation, the, the, uh, the decrease in frequency is close to three uh, events per year, and the duration decreases by two days per event and long-term mean by almost 2.2 uh, 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 degrees Celsius per, per event. So now um, uh, the, the more details we have documented in our paper, but we propose the following mechanism, which helps understand the soil moisture temperature coupling on the temperature extremes through the dry and, and the wet sensitive, uh, soil moisture sensitivity experiments. In case of dry sensitivity run, uh, the below normal soil moisture conditions cause an increase in the sensible heat uh, flux, uh, which entrains more energy back into the, into the atmosphere and thereby uh, it, it actually increases the near surface air temperature, of course, due to li limited evapotranspiration and a drop in soil moisture memory, which I mentioned earlier. Whereas in the in the wet conditions, the near surface air temperature is moderated through the um, enhanced latent heat flux and net conversion into the sensible heat flux, and this limits the high temperature occurrences in the in the atmosphere. So uh, these are the summary and conclusions. So uh, our study indicates that more than 70% area of the Indian land mass is projected to have experienced significant changes in in the uh, characteristics of extreme temperature due to soil moisture variations alone. Again, it is uh, not only due to soil moisture. I mean, uh, this is through our sensitivity experiments. There are multiple factors which other uh, speakers have already mentioned. In particular, larger impact of soil moisture perturbations on extreme temperature characteristics is found to be um, um, happening over the uh, strong coupling zone of uh, north central India, which is known as the hottest spot of uh, soil moisture temperature coupling. And of course, when we decrease or increase the soil moisture, it has different impacts in the historical and future climate. Over North Central India, a 20% departure in soil moisture significantly revamps the frequency, duration, and intensity of extreme temperature by two to five events per year, one to two days per event, and almost 0.5 to 2.1 degrees Celsius, respectively, the intensity uh, by modulating the surface energy partitioning, enhancing the surface heat flux, and limiting the uh, latent heat flux and the reverse happens in in case of uh, the wet simulations so one more point i would like to highlight is this also um, um, necessitates the uh, the requirement of having more and more uh, reliable observations of soil moisture our our uh, analysis and experience says that still although reanalysis products are pretty good on seasonal scale but when you go deeper and deeper, even in the uh, below 10 centimeters of the soil, the variations are not captured well. And maybe these kind of things become very important when you go into the seasonal forecast and other things because assimilating those kind of uh, information becomes very important. Yeah. So with this, I will end my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Bhupendra. So we can have one quick question. सर uh, uh, मुझे पूछना था कि अगर ये soil moisture पे ही impact करता है uh, या temperature या soil nutrient uh, के ऊपर भी impact करता है क्योंकि temperature बढ़ने से तो land surface temperature almost बढ़े बढ़ता ही रहे मतलब four या five degree Celsius या उससे ज़्यादा degree Celsius से बढ़ता है तो उस पे उससे soil nutrient पे कुछ प्रभाव पड़ता है क्या मतलब कुछ losses होता है क्या उसमें See I am not expert in that field but of course there will be some impact because even not only on nutrients you have microorganisms and and so on which which aids in the agricultural productivity right so all those things are are prone to the um prone to the uh, adversities of rise in extreme temperature or even rise in the mean temperature so yes there should be some impact okay okay so thank you bupendra 
so now before moving to the next uh, talk we have the organizers have some announcements so uh so as per the schedule uh, there were poster presentation after this uh, four presentation but there is slight change in the uh, program schedule so we will continue this session and uh, still we are having three more talks in that and after that we will have a dedicated session only for the reviewing of poster uh, so for that i will again announce and uh, at that time all the presenters of the posters are uh, requested to please be there so that the evaluation committee can come and evaluate your poster thank you thank you so now we will move on to the presentation which we had in the last session so from dr saurav seal of iit bhuvneshwar he will be talking on the marine heat waves in the bay of bengal and possible impacts So very good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be talking on the marine heat waves in the Bay of Bengal possible impacts. So as uh, Dr. Oxy was mentioning the criteria, so generally we assume the uh, means whatever the criteria uh, we are following now uh, from Hubble et al. 2016 that if the temperature is more than 90th percentile and at least it stay for five days, we'll uh, call as a marine heat waves. And if there is a gap between two marine trips one or two day will count as a uh, as a single event okay and there are uh, many studies which uh, i just want to show you that's mainly all 2019 they have mentioned uh, that it have a uh, adverse effect on the ecosystem uh, so like increasing all the marine heat wave days uh, and the coral bleaching also happening uh, here also seagrass the density actually is going down and uh, also their biomass is going down there is another study by Smith or uh, it all they have basically have uh, studied on the marine heat waves, particularly on the marine habitats, and they found that uh, you can see all over the region, particular species of the uh, marine lives are uh, impacted. Uh, for particular Indian oceans, you can see mostly are coral leaves. There are some marine mammals. Uh, all those things are uh, very much impacted by these things. So uh, this is something we need to. Uh, study uh, that uh, uh, means uh, what are uh, happening there. So you can see the marine waves can ha happen in various scale. Uh, particularly, you can see uh, that whatever the criteria we are taking, uh, like 90th percentile, with this criteria, we can get marine heat waves at the equator, we can get at the pole, we can get at the summer time and also in the winter. So, uh, so that is that things you can see. It is uh, there are some events which has been identified by previous uh, researcher. Uh, we have at the equator and even we have the, in the polar regions and here the marine heat wave duration can vary like it's more than a year also and uh, intensity can go up to 4 degrees centigrade and uh, here another study by Holbrook it all they identified that mostly uh, those marine heat wave events are uh, dominated means uh, basically due to the climatic events uh, like they have a north pacific gyre dmi uh, el nino modoki all those things they have identified and the zones they have detected that which zones is are impacted by which if you see for our indian ocean this part is mostly due to you can see this is the dmi but here in the bay of bengal it's impacted by uh, almost uh, all the things you can see all the color combination is there so uh, with that uh, this is the two study uh, I, I want to greatly acknowledge uh, uh, one is uh, on the left side you can see this uh, whatever the rocks was mentioning uh, in their uh, the paper and this is from the uh, inquiries so both uh, means whatever they uh, try to identify it, to quantify that how it is increasing, uh, particularly in uh, monsoon time and in on annual scale. But one interesting result here I want to highlight that you can see this is the which is almost the gray bar which is telling nil. Okay, so there are some cases where uh, and which is dominating that it is not due to the any climate events. So there are some events which is coming due to the uh, means local or internal variability within the ocean. So that things we need to highlight that what are the possible causes in uh, that. 
and here uh, another uh, study by Janardji uh, et al. They have also mentioned uh, that what are the area and which are the climatic index can impact on the marine heat waves. So uh, here I just want to uh, uh, ask, I mean, uh, uh, there's some question that if it is there uh, in the Bay of Bengal, uh, mostly those studies are uh, taken from the SST data. So if you take a particular uh, point observation, which is like we, I have taken the Rama at 15 degree north, 90 degrees to I'm putting the RM15. So how does it look at a particular location based uh, things? What are the characteristics? And uh, mostly uh, if marine heat waves is there, uh, where it is starting and how it is spreading. It's not like that uh, everywhere it will go uh, um, start developing at a time. It can develop uh, and it can uh, spread uh, with some oceanic processes and how it can spread, we'll uh, look into that. And is there any subsurface marine heat waves? So that also because we have the data, uh, GUI data here, which have uh, can give uh, the observation up to 500 meter uh, uh, daily data. So we can utilize to see uh, is there any marine heat waves condition is there in the subsurface or not. And what are the other impacts on cyclone profile and even land heat waves. So uh, this is the uh, things where I already discussed that criteria. So here particularly uh, taken from the YSST and from 1982 to 2018 we have taken. So particularly you will see that wherever the, you are getting the red bars showing the events where the marine is, is happening. So particular 87, 88, 97, 98, 2019 and 15, 16. You can see all these things either you have a IOD events, positive IOD or El Nino events where you are getting uh, this marine heat wave conditions and also with the time the intensity has also increased. And here we are comparing with the uh, another SST high resolution GHR SST and also we are seeing their coinciding. We also checked with the Ramabui, uh, we have not shown but here you can see uh, if you see direct correlation with SST not the marine heat wave things we are more than 0.8 correlation and daily intensity if we count from RM15 over uh, 2008 to 18, 11 years. So they are very close by. So whatever you are seeing from the observation, you can also see from the buoy data. Now here, uh, I want to show this animation. So uh, you can see that there are some uh, patches, uh, or greenish patches, which is showing the marine heat waves. If it is yellow, it is like 1.4. And uh, in the background, there are currents. So you can see there are when there is a current system at uh, marine heat waves initially generated here, and then it is propagating with this boundary currents. Okay, so it is basically spreading uh, spreading the uh, warmer water from one zone to other and also there is some eddies which is also tracking this information from one place to other. And this is uh, uh, one thing uh, which we have done from a net heat flux and uh, the wind. So we found that whenever there is a weak wind and uh, uh, basically the when heat waves are uh, uh, there and also the sort of radiation of uh, increasing. So that is another factor. So here uh, we have taken some years and we compare uh, with the uh, Rama data. Uh, there are many information, but what I want to tell you that whenever there is a uh, marine heat waves condition, we are seeing where the mixed layer depth is very less and also the, the brandweiser frequency, which basically uh, tell about the stability, that is more. So this whatever the uh, localized effect are due to the silo mixed layer uh, depth as well as the uh, Stratification and eddies and boundary currents are basically spreading uh, those heat wave condition over the Bay of Bengal. Now, if you see that what is happening uh, during the uh, subsurface, so here we can see this, uh, but uh, the subsurface condition actually is dominating during the negative IOD events because in negative IOD events we have a strong coastal Kelvin waves so, and also the radiative Rossby waves. So that actually defends the uh, uh, D20. Three and you can see there is a hundred. I we took we took hundred meter temperature and you can see there is a long uh, a period of the marine heat waves at the subsurface, which is around hundred meter. So uh, that can be observed not only surface but in the subsurface also. Here, uh, uh, cyclone I already have discussed. So I am skipping. I am going to the land heat waves, but that is nicely explained in uh, Dr. Roxy's presentation. But here, here the same event uh, and similar time uh, we have taken in May uh, to, uh, 2020. So here we know that we have an Amphan uh, cyclone here and in this Western Indian region, we have a, a heat wave condition, but you can see in the coastal uh, Arabian uh, Sea region, there are actually a sustained marine heat condition is there and there is some wind actually going there. So that surface warmer uh, SST can also influence the, uh, the land heat waves, but it needs a, a, a more detailed study that how they are doing and uh, how much. 
so this is the conclusion that whatever the YSST and GHRSST we are seeing that is actually is also matching with the point observation. So this data is good to use for studying those marine heat waves. Uh, positive uh, events, they mostly uh, the heat waves are seen at the surface. And in negative events, we see uh, in the subsurface. Uh, and uh, for uh, local means, which is a sort of time scale, uh, this is mostly due to the stratifications, eddies, and the boundary currents uh, things. And cyclone and also the biological uh, productivity are being uh, hampered by the existence of the uh, marine heat waves. And uh, also, this uh, uh, suggests that we need, uh, there are many other observations like Argo and all those things, but Argo don't give a Daily data that is challenged, but it can be useful for starting the subsurface marine nutrients. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can have one or two quick questions. If not, we can go to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So next is by Ayushi Tandon. Uh, from University of Petroleum and Energy Studies. She'll be talking on understanding climate variability in North India and machine learning perspective. Dear all, as we know that we have gathered here to address the most pressing concern of this era, that is the climate variability. When I specifically note down about North India, the region is typically diverse. Excuse me. The region is typically diverse and the climate change influence have affected lives and livelihood in the past few years. But among these complexities, there lies a beacon of hope, that is, the transformative powers of machine learning. A very present good afternoon to all the presentees. Today, I, Ayushi Tandon, research scholar from University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dehradun, is going to talk about understanding climate variability in North India, a machine learning perspective. So this is the outline of my presentation. First, I'll give a brief background. Then, integrating machine learning with climate, the questions that I'm going to address in this study, data and methodologies followed, results, summary, and a future scope. So this is the background of my study, as I've already quoted, that North India is geographically varied, and the elevations level from thousands of feet to six thousand of feet pose a great challenge for scientific exploration. By the time, we have also observed with continuous IPCC reports that climate change is altering the variability and intensity of extreme weather events. Already, it has been quoted in yesterday's many of the presentation regarding the extreme events over North India, the hydrological agricultural aspects, and uh, about the leveraging ideas that machine learning can do for this field. However, the temperature and extreme events have been studied by most of the study. Uh, interrelationship between these studies is very understudied. So artificial intelligence and machine learning can be harnessed to combat the climate change. And from an institute where uh, computation powers are not such bloomed, machine learning offers a promising avenue. So while integrating machine learning with climate, first of all, we should know what is machine learning. As we are aware about the terms data science, deep learning, machine learning, but we specifically refer these all the same. Artificial intelligence enables a machine to learn like human-like intelligence. Further, machine learning being a subset of AI give machine the powers to learn and evaluate over time, recognize patterns, and that too without explicitly being programmed. In the literature, it has been observed that machine learning has been used in climate predictions. 
assessing climate change impacts biodiversity conservation monitoring monitoring energy consumption and deforest track uh, deforestation tracking so questions that will be addressed in this study are is machine learning app of identifying relationship um, among climatic variables what is the accuracy that a machine learning algorithm achieve do these results are consistent how reliable these models are and can this model be applied to any other extreme events so the data that i have used in my study is modern era retrospective analysis for research and application version 2 for this presentation i have uh, taken two case studies from rajasthan and himachal pradesh two different uh, regions with a varying uh, elevation of 431 meters and other with a 2225 meters the data spans from 1984 to 2023 nearly 40 years the spatial resolution is 0.5 by 0.6 degrees following a daily temporal resolution considering uh, these parameters such as temperature precipitation till dew point and some machine learning models specifically mentioned so first of all we drew the correlation between different atmospheric variables over the region this slide specifically show about uh, the rajasthan and on this we have derived a table which is on the left hand side depicting the correlation levels such as strong positive weak negative uh, between different variables for precipitation and temperature this was at the confidence level of 0.05 uh, significance level we ran machine learning algorithm random forest support vector machine xgboost and k nearest neighbor across different splits over the data and we found that 80 20 split was the best and achieving the highest accuracy nearly uh, 83% so we have observed precipitation extreme curves on the left hand side we have taken all the variables that uh, we chose for our study and on the right hand side we only took the significant variables from the correlation plot we found that 10 percentile value for precipitation extremes over rajasthan was 0.30 mm and for the 95th percentile it was 18 mm higher performance of machine learning models are observed for events that are below the 10th percentile however there was a significant increase from all variables to significant variables for the class 2 data that is the 95th percentile percentile value so overall there was enhanced model performance when we focus significantly on the variables that have a greater impact the same study we did for temperature extremes and with the threshold value of 20 4 degrees and a uh, 95th percentile value for 43 degrees and we uh, we got to know that the performance has decreased for temperature when we only considered the significant variables so to evaluate our model more we did the same study for himachal pradesh which is of different topography when we uh, look it in relation to the uh, rajasthan state so here we found that support vector machine was performing the best and that to at 60 to 40 accuracies 60 to uh, uh, 60 to 40 depicts the training and testing distribution of data that we have performed here the uh, study for precipitation precipitation extremes yield similar results that was uh, same for the state of rajasthan like the accuracy decrease from uh, for prediction 10 percentile values to 95 percentile values however uh, the model performance was enhanced but overall it was a uh, least performing model the same thing was done for temperature extreme values to it so uh, after uh, watching these extreme values and calculating the area under curve we got to know that model performed the best but when we talk about robustness of this model in predicting different events we calculated the brier score and we uh, saw that the model did not perform really well for uh, rajasthan and himachal pradesh but significantly well for all the temperature values either all variables are significant brier score tell, tells us the uh, probability distribution accuracy and as much as it is near to zero the model is more robust and good 
So these are the questions that I wanted to address. So is machine learning apt of identifying relationship? Yes, surely it is. The achievable accuracy, it was between 82 to 84 percent. Do machine learning algorithm produce consistent result? If not, what factors contribute to variability? The machine learning algorithm produce uh, consistent result in case of temperature, but in case of extreme precipitation, it do does not. Uh, performed relatively well. Uh, as we cannot change the data here, because machine learning algorithms are data dependent, so it can be due to the inherent complexity of the algorithm, data quality, or the feature selection that we are doing. Uh, hyperparameter also adds a, a positive feature for this role. So how, how reliable the uh, skill score or the model, how much is reliable? It is reliable for temperature extremes, we can say, but for rainfall, it needs further refinements. So, and this models can also be applied for uh, other extreme events also. So this is a future uh, prospect. For extreme events, we particularly need to enhance algorithm in case of extreme precipitation. And uh, we need to develop a real-time framework for these meteorological events as we have are focusing on heat waves particularly. And after achieving a certain accuracy, we can uh, automate this process for a timely programming. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Arshi. So any questions? No? OK. Thank you. Thank you. So now we will move on to Lakshmi. She'll be talking on observed intensification of moist heat stress over the Indian region. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Lakshmi. I'm a MOS Research Fellow from IMD Pune. So today I will be talking about the observed intensification of moist heat stress over the Indian region. So these are the contents of uh, my presentation. So starting with the dry and moist heat stress. So we know that the heat waves are the meteorological hazards from today morning onwards we are hearing this uh, these statements like of extreme temperature event over any region that can cause severe impacts in different sectors. So what is then heat stress? Heat stress is actually the net load, net heat load to which someone is exposed to. And what the human body or any body responds to it is the heat strain. So basically heat stress can be categorized into two. That is uh, the dry heat stress and the moist heat stress. So what actually differentiates these two are the physiological response of the human body towards these heat stress. So the first thing being in a, in a condition of high ambient temperature, basically in a low humidity condition, it will cause evaporative cooling. And then uh, if it further extends, then it can lead to dehydration. But at the same time, if it is a high humidity condition, this evaporation process cannot take place effectively. And this will lead to uh, the higher core body temperature and can ultimately uh, reach to a heat stroke and heat death itself. So a bit more on the role of moisture in driving human heat stress, as have been already discussed earlier also, almost the uh, almost 75 percentage of the heat loss from a human body actually takes place through the process of evaporation. So whenever there is a high humidity that is in the uh, atmosphere, the body cannot cope up with the uh, with the high ambient temperature condition because of the ineffective evaporation. Now, in the recent years, India have actually and many places have actually witnessed these heat related deaths, even in conditions with ambient temperatures less than the uh, threshold criteria of the operationally monitoring heat waves. So for those situations, somewhat maybe the role of uh, humidity is more important and that we have to look into. So uh, this actually is a previous study. Uh, I have discussed this earlier also in uh, uh, earlier also in last year. So to set the context of my current discussion, I'll just brush up on this topic that uh, we know or we it's already known that there is a summer temperature intra-seasonal variability over the Indian region. And uh, uh, two dominant modes are associated to it. The first one 
the, the both these modes are actually driven by the mid latitudinal rossby waves and uh, these are the spatial patterns of these uh, modes and those are the drivers the first one being driven by the subtropical rossby wave and the second one driven by the extratropical rossby wave so why i am talking about this is that then we try to identify are these modes which explain the summer temperature variability are connecting or can we attribute them to the dry heat stress and moist heat stress over indian region so for a first order analysis we did a correlation uh, so we saw that the pc1 was having a strong positive temp uh, positive correlation with temperature and pc2 was having a positive correlation with humidity especially in the east coast and the central indian region and whenever these modes are active that is for those days when pc1 is greater than 1 and pc2 is greater than 1 the heat index which represents the heat stress over uh, a region actually showed a 4 to 5 degree celsius rise from the mean condition whenever these modes are active so that means somewhat these modes are attributing towards the uh, heat stress that is occurring over these regions now a bit more on the mode 2 or uh, how these modes are actually attributing this um, dry and moist heat stress so first from the first plot uh, the left top one so you can see this is the uh, distribution distribution of uh, sorry histogram of the maximum temperature and the diurnal uh, temperature range that is maximum minus minimum temperature relative humidity and heat index for those days when pc1 is greater than 1 and the second uh, row shows for those days when pc2 is greater than 1 so uh, if you can find you can see a this uh -huh. you can see a difference between these two distributions here the maximum temperature anomaly is having a higher range uh, which is different from this thing it is going to a much lower range uh, when pc2 is active that is more 2 is active and when you look at the relative humidity which is blue uh, bars which has shown so that is having a somewhat lesser humidity in the mode 2 and higher humidity distribution in the uh, second mode so they show they are showing a clear dis a distinction between the dry and the moist condition associated to these two modes an interesting thing to note is that even though the humidity and temperature profiles are different for this they are actually causing similar discomfort which is uh, which is shown using this orange color uh, distribution which shows the heat index so both these modes whenever these modes are active the heat index is uh, having the same distribution pattern or the same uh, heat index is occurring but there uh, the the contribution from humidity and the temperature is different for these two modes so similar uh, results we obtained from the spatial distribution also these are the um, like percentage of grid points that actually had uh, this maximum temperature and the humidity above some threshold limits for each day they also showed the similar result that there is a clear distinction between these two uh, like temperature and humidity becomes dominant in mode 1 and mode 2 respectively now coming to mode 2 intensification so why understanding mode 2 is more important is that when we see the long uh, long term trend of these two modes we found that the mode 2 is actually having a significant increasing trend over the indian region that uh, that leads to the conclusion that there uh, there could be a rise in the moist heat stress occurring over the indian region so this has to be noted further so is there any intensification process actually that is happening over the indian region whenever these modes are coming so for that uh, we uh, did some analysis and we found that this is the uh, maximum temperature the percentage of grid points when the maximum temperature is greater than 40 degrees celsius these two so whenever the mode 2 is greater that is pc2 is greater than 1 and these are for pc2 is greater than 2 so we see that from lag 7 onwards there is a gradual increase in the percentage of grid points where the uh, the maximum temperature is increasing and when coming to uh, even more stronger events there is a even steeper uh, rise in the temperature condition so there is some kind of intensification process that is taking place uh, taking place when these two modes are active similar thing we can see from the uh, vorticity and the temperature evolution also we see that from lag 7 onwards there is a, a, a falling or there is a decrease in the uh, vorticity which actually uh, points towards the anticyclonic vorticity over the indian region and corresponding response in the temperature as well so some kind of intensification process 
is taking place over the Indian region associated to Motu. Now, these, uh, this is the vorticity anomaly uh, associated to the Motu itself from lag minus 7 to uh, lead 1. So from lag 3 onwards or 4, four days before itself, so we can see that a clear intensification of anticyclonic vorticity over the Indian region is noted. And uh, so how or why this intensification process is occurring? So that we are looking into right now and uh, it's, it's a currently ongoing uh, study. And many local uh, factors can be attributed to this, like uh, sea surface temperature condition like this. There was noted that some Indian Ocean, over the Indian Ocean, uh, there was a warming uh, noted during the intensification or whenever these associated to these strong events. And for this, actually, we uh, we are looking into this and uh, we are like... Uh, for understanding these aspects, actually, modeling studies are required. And uh, this is a preliminary result we tried to get from a barotropic uh, model. So from this, we see that um, when we give a source over this uh, region, we actually see an uh, anticyclonic vorticity persisting over the Indian region. And we have to look into how like these anticyclonic vorticity is actually persisting over the Indian region or it is getting amplified. So for intensification, we are considering these two aspects, how it is like amplifying or it is persisting over the Indian region for a longer time. So this understanding is required from this. So further modeling analysis is required. So this is the final uh, plot. So to uh, since we have said that there is uh, the mode one and mode two can be attributed to the dry and moist heat stress, uh, like. Uh, we can use this for the operational applications also to monitor the dry and moist heat stress condition over the Indian region. So this is one scatter diagram similar to the uh, uh, Wheeler and Hendon RMM index itself. So using the PC1 and PC2, we can actually uh, find uh, all these like the dry heat stress and moist heat stress conditions occurring over the Indian region. So from this plot, actually three aspects we are uh, finding. One is the spatial extent of the event, and the second one is the amplitude of the event, and the third one is the impact. That is whether it is a dry event or, or it is a moist event. So this is one of the operational application that is possible from this. So that is the end of my uh, talk, and these are the conclusions. So basically, the mode two, uh, the, sum, uh, the two modes which we identified as to explain the summer temperature variability over the Indian region. So from that, the mode two is actually driving the regional moist heat stress over the Indian region and they it is showing a long-term increasing trend over the Indian region as well. There is an intensification process taking place over the Indian region. So how like many local factors including sea surface temperature and soil moisture can be attributed to, uh, to this and for understanding this for the modeling uh, analysis and studies are required. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are any questions. Okay, uh, thank you. So Satyapan, what we will do, we will break now. Uh, no, no, that we will take in uh, panel discussion because that there we can uh, adjust. Yeah. Now that is not scientific thing, so we can go. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sahai sir and uh, Sushmita Joseph, ma'am. Uh, so, for uh, uh, to felicitate uh, chair and co-chair of the session, I would like to invite a uh, retired scientist from IMD Pune, uh, uh, Dr. B. Mukhopadhyay, sir, to please come on the stage. And also invite uh, Dr. R. H. Kriplani, sir. Uh, Co-chair of this session, Dr. Sushmita Joseph, ma'am, from IITM Pune. 
and we have a series of lectures in this session so one by one i would like to invite dr roxy m call from iitm pune first uh, after this professor joy monter from iser pune and if he is not present there then next uh, dr sahadul islam from cdec pune and dr bhupender singh from iitm pune next dr saurav sel from iit bhubneshwar and next is uh, ms ayushi tandon if she is present here please come forward otherwise uh, ms uh, lakshmi from imd pune so thank you all the uh, senior uh, scientists and uh, officials to uh, join this uh, felicitation event uh, now we will have a tea break and also along with this uh, the posters uh, Uh, to be evaluated from the evaluation committee so it is once again requested to all the students participants and presenters to be present there in front of their poster uh, placed outside and we will again join here in this uh, conference room at 5 pm uh, for panel discussion
a very good evening to everyone so uh, now we are uh, towards the end of today's uh, national symposium so before starting our panel discussion uh, i would request dr satyaban bishoy ratna sir to please uh, briefly uh, tell about the in uh, agenda points of this panel discussion good afternoon everyone uh whole day today we have a very intensive discussion on the various aspects of uh, heat waves science its a mechanism and uh, applications and uh, risk and uh, impact on economy so at the end of this session or end of this day it will be good to have a some concluding discussion or it will be good to have a take opinion for the all the participants and the panelists to say the final remarks on this uh, panel discussion so on this aspects or uh, the committee member have identified three important topics to discuss uh, that we i am going to say then uh, we would like to invite the five panel members and the moderator to the stage so that we can discuss on these aspects so the first point we would like to uh, discuss regarding this uh, heat wave is the, uh, there is a importance of uh, upscaling the heat action plants and minimizing the mortality and uh, uh, morbidity which is a most priority at this stage and the second point we can say is we also need a more uh, comprehensive assessment of the impacts of extreme heats uh, that includes the data of the health parameters and the uh, urban heat islands and the third point is as india is soon is about to launch the national framework for climate services which the ministry of uh, air science is leading in coordinate with different ministries so it will be good how nfcs can help to minimizing the risk uh, minimize the risk associated with extreme heat which required a uh, collaborative effort or a multi institutional mechanism so that the third point we will discuss that how nfcs is going to help the the other two aspects we have discussed that is the one the the reducing the mortality and morbidity another is the how to uh, assess the impact of extreme heat and the availability of health parameters data with this i request dr asa to invite the panel members and moderator for this session thank you so much sir so for uh, to start this panel discussion i would like to invite uh, uh, our uh, panelist for that so i would like to request uh, to take the place on the stage dr r k kohli sir uh, dr r krishnan sir uh, shri s c bhan sir professor purnima das gupta ma'am and professor rajshri kotharkar ma'am and uh, we request uh, shri s c bhan sir to kindly moderate this panel discussion thank you dr asha uh, i welcome all of you uh to this final session of very exciting day of discussion on various aspects of heat wave uh <clears throat> so in the concluding session satyaban has given some task to me some of the points so uh, i have all those points and one by one maybe i'll take these points to uh the panelist here and uh, maybe then the delegates in the hall can also intervene after the expert uh, provide their views uh, so considering the expertise of the people here and uh, seeing a long uh, involvement 
Uh, the first point, uh, Satyabhan told, with the upscaling of heat action plans. We have some heat action plan in the country, which some of them are city specific, some of them are state, spe state specific. And how to minimize the mortality, morbidity associated with the heat with an aim of zero heat related mortalities. Uh, that question I can throw open to Professor Jaisiri, can you take that? Huh? Upscaling heat action plan and the, you can give, it's working, you can take this. This is working. Upscaling heat action plan, I mean, one is that how do we go ahead and to what extent can it be done? I think the short term uh, framework of heat action plan can be taken up to multiple cities and multiple uh, states rather I would say can be taken to the various climatic regions also. So the I would say that the base, the, the uh, roadmap for it could be that we identify cities in each climatic region, couple of them and start implementing or understanding certain say local threshold and other things with respect to that particular climate and then move ahead uh, towards uh, taking it to various other cities because there'll be a support of science and e then, then it can get finer and it can become better. And as I said in my presentation also that it is just the beginning. But for this one would require a, a multidisciplinary approach and something at the national level where this can be taken up as a single point agenda that's as to how do we uh, improve the heat action plan framework and take it to the to various climatic regions and for implementation I think one would require an extensive capacity building of the local urban local bodies that's important uh, and except can can you also in that process through some of lights on we have heat action plans in many parts of the country they have how they are implemented or not you may not be satisfied with that I, I'm sure uh, but taking those at base, what additionalities would you like to suggest to be included in the heat action plans whenever and wherever they are upgraded or are extended to? I would say that if uh, the rapid heat risk or heat vulnerability assessment, if that is done, then the local municipal, I mean local urban bodies would know exactly where to take the measures because currently we just have the vulnerable groups identified. Partially we don't know which areas are vulnerable. So if to begin with if we could do that and focus more on uh, those areas and those sectors I think it will give us because it's a low hanging fruit it will give us a lot of benefits. Thank you uh, Dr. Asri. Uh, anyone in the audience if you want to add something to that and if you have any question to be asked to any of the panelists. So if not, another issue which I feel important is uh, related to heat action plants in the research on how the climate would be in future because that also needs to be factored into the heat action plants what is going to happen in near future and maybe slightly far future also. Uh, so the tremendous amount of research is being done in the country uh, and I would request uh, no other than Director IITM, Dr. Kishnanji, who, who I would request him to shed a light on this, what direction and what specific efforts would be needed so that the knowledge generated can directly be applied for uh, societal purposes. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Pansa. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate all of you and uh, congratulate IMSP and uh, thank you all for participating. I understand this was a very, very productive and uh, meeting with a lot of stimulating discussions. I'm sorry I could not uh, be part of this meeting due to various commitments. Uh, 
so yeah this uh, topic of today with this morning also secretary made some very important points that we need to bring out various indices of heat waves in addition to our own forecast products as far as the research is concerned uh, so one is making the long term projections at high resolution that's what we are also planning so iatm is already preparing for the cmip 7 so i think uh, heat wave is one of those things that uh, definitely we will assess that and already some efforts are going on but from a more practical point this uh, short range and uh, medium range extended range forecasts of heat waves and uh, developing various indices will be very very important uh, for even the heat action plan and uh, recently i happened to review a few theses phd theses and uh, one of them is already here uh, dr arulal from IIT uh, Delhi, and uh, he has done excellent work on the heat waves. I think he presented on the uh, atmospheric blocking, and uh, so there are different ways of looking at the heat waves. And uh, he also, in one of the chapter, I think he assessed heat waves using the because usually they infer from the station data the heat waves, but once you are using the models uh, like the CMIP models or climate projection, they this is a gridded data product. So I think he has used the logic by Sushmita et al, which was she was developed for the heat waves. Is that correct? Harlal? She applied the same logic for the climate projections and uh, trying to assess the extreme heat waves. So uh, so a lot of work is already from the research I'm seeing from India, it is already coming out. Likewise, uh, IIT Roorkee, I also evaluated a PhD work on the compound extremes, uh, not only heat, also precipitation. And um, so many groups in uh, I, in India are already working on this problem. And so with availability of more data sets, and uh, so this research is, I mean, it's going to gain momentum. And uh, people also realize that uh, using the gridded data will not give the same results like the station data. So now they are also trying to use the, wherever observations are there, uh, they will use the gridded data and use some AIML techniques so in the, for the past period and uh, use that knowledge to make projections in the future. So that could be one potential opportunity. So observations are going to become very important. And um, also there was one more recent paper by IIT Delhi uh, on the extreme heat wave in Pakistan in 2022, which later on uh, many places I mean, experienced temperatures like 50 50 degrees and uh, also North India and later on it uh, there was heavy rainfall flooding glacier melt so the the thing is it's not only temperature it is affecting other other components of the climate system like the cryosphere when the biosphere and also the health uh, which has come out so developing these indices will be very very important and um, this uh, group I mean the IIT Delhi the Krishna Chutra Arulalan so that was an event attribution of the 2022 heat wave. So normally you require large ensembles. So that, that already they showed that uh, this event, like the 2022 uh, pre-monsoon heat wave, uh, it is because of climate change. It was a very specific event attribution. So these type of problems already people have started working, papers are coming out. Um, so I think this is going to grow more and more in the future. But in addition, the short range forecasting and the medium extended range forecasting already IATM is doing, Dr. Sushmita's group. I think that we have to scale it up. What are the, now presently, what is the status? What are the problems we are having? How to in enhance it further? I think that we should focus. And that is going to provide an input to all this heat action plan. When you're talking about a city level, uh, so building that capability will be will be very very important mm -hmm. and monitoring what is uh, because there are, it's also related to the melting of the glaciers and the uh, formation of the glacier lakes and outflows that they, because this came out even in the 150 years of IMD uh, because of the heat wave the gloves are going to increase the other one is the um, uh, health impact and also cloud bursts so I think uh, so trying to see the connection between the uh, gloves and the cloud burst and its linkage to the extreme heat is going to be important. And uh, for this year, I think now already people are telling that 
uh, this pre monsoon heat waves are projected even from imd so we have to see what what will be its impact on the monsoon um, and also there are other things like soil moisture changes because last year many places were dry rainfall was deficit soil uh, moisture was dry and um, so it's going to be interesting what will happen to the lightning activity so this year it will be interesting to see and um, so a lot of research is need is there and uh, so observations modeling and um, uh, developing new analysis techniques and r and d is very very important we have to uh, definitely it's already happening i'm i'm very happy to see that so many iits icers are doing we really need to scale it up because it is happening at such a fast rate uh, even that we are unable to catch up with one extreme to another so a lot of work is needed and i'm sure a lot of youngsters are showing promise and uh, i'm sure that there's a lot of hope yeah. thank you very thank much thank you sir thank you very much thank you. and next step in management uh, comes that we should know uh, how and what does the heat and hot weather has the impacts upon uh, so assessment of the impacts and maybe vulnerability including mortality morbidity of different sectors of society loss of productivity and other economic burdens associated with heat waves and uh, we have a specialist uh, person from institute of economic growth dr purnita i think she would be the most appropriate person to respond to that uh, ma'am please thank you um so in terms of uh, economic impacts as we know that there are many pathways between heat health and the economic consequences and uh, these pathways can and there are different and these have implications of costs and risks which can differ a lot depending on the scale at which we should look at we look at it so perhaps uh, it's different for individuals and communities so to give an example from some work that i did um so there were cities which had passed regulations to halt work during uh, certain hours of the day where particularly for outdoor workers and one of the things that came back while doing stakeholder engagements was that uh, the workers themselves were not very happy they in some instances they were being compensated to some extent for the number of uh, work hours lost in the day but what they were missing out on was overtime because there were no more hours left during the day to earn overtime and depending on where you are in that income earning ladder that becomes an issue because you cannot get more than 8 hours once you take out those uh you know uh, hours when you restrict work so that's an economic consequence and you may ask who bears this cost the other uh, individual or community level costs that came up in the same sort of in the same piece of work was that uh particularly women said to compensate for those 8 hours they work in the evenings takes away their time from domestic work and time spent with children in the evening and it was interesting that some of the respondents said that in any case we are not very well equipped to guide small children in their homework but now it's virtually impossible we all hire tutors now i do not know to what extent this is something true or not true and how many people are impacted like that but it was an unexpected narrative that came back to us when we had gone in with the mental framing that this is a great thing that has happened and we all agree still that it is a good thing to reduce exposure to this hazard of heat right but there are economic consequences the reason i bring this up is because we have to remember to the next point where we need to invest where there are costs involved 
is that vulnerable populations are also crisis oriented. Often vulnerable populations when defined by income are people who are actually putting a lot more focus on things other than heat. So capacities have to be built, constant reminders and awareness and communication has to be done. This brings its own costs for the system. From the systemic side, there are costs to be able to not only just have those plans in place, but to execute and implement those plans effectively. So some of the best examples and successes are when these are done, even when, we, not just before the heat season, but done even when there is no heat season. That is what experience shows. So these are recurring costs. The third level of costs and economic consequences is to be, to gear up the health system itself to be able to meet the increased OPD inpatient, whatever admissions, treatment, care, ambulance, emergency ambulance services. It's a whole lot of provisioning, Anganwadi workers, to give them the, uh, not just the skill sets, but also to give them the provisioning to support their uh, activities. Right? Because maybe you're giving a different sort of fluid intake. You're upping the fluid intake, recommended fluid uh, intake that she should advise or she should provide twice, thrice from what she normally does. So there are these costs. So there are systemic costs towards managing the interventions well. And they hit different people at different levels. The, finally, I would, the next thing I would say is though, that these are what we call public goods, right? There's a huge positive externality associated with risk reduction. And we want, we want to harvest and harness this huge uh, value for society. And realizing this value means that we should be willing to make this investment. And on one hand, of course, which means science investing also in cross-disciplinary, not both uh, in individual disciplines as well as multidisciplinary, science, R&D, um, and policy science, policy implementation. These are also requirements, uh, what we call soft financing which is also something that perhaps we need to think about, not just for heat, but climate extremes in general. And right from how we build our heat indices, data sets, capacities, down to how we implement our policies. That is one. The other is that the engagement. There are costs, economic costs to engagement. But there are huge payoffs and values to society which makes it worth it. There are costs of engagement. There are transaction costs, as we economists call it. But it's still very worth it, perhaps. If you do the cost benefit, it almost always comes out uh, uh, very highly fa if, uh, skewed in favor of the benefits. It's, uh, but so these are network costs, so um, networks of institutions bringing together dis in, uh, different disciplines. Similarly, for a public sector, I think multiple departments getting into it, which we are seeing now. So the um, National Health Mission has incorporated heat into its uh, mission statement and into some, several of the guidances that it is now uh, providing. One of the things is, for example, I've started asking myself, can the HMIS system start reporting uh, deaths by cause? It's fairly easy. The HMIS system is up and running across primary health centers and uh, even across the primary, secondary, tertiary care centers. Small things can make a big difference to us as researchers who are trying to you know, unravel all these challenges. But I really thought, you know, for heat indices, for instance, can there be age and place uh, sensitive heat indices? Does a heat index have to be a heat index? It does it, is it, this is my question, I don't know. 
Oh. Is it possible to make it more sensitive? But these questions are better answered if you can set up that network. The moment you yeah. said you would have a national climate uh, services being launched, could it? Could one of the activities be just to put together a network of institutions from different disciplines? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pumita. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody from the audience? You have an expert of economy which I'm meeting for the first time, formally, informally, I had a few discussions. It's a good opportunity for the younger lord. If you have any question, you can pose to her. Maybe Dr. Krishnan and myself won't be able to answer to those queries properly. So try to take benefit of that, if you have any questions. So if not, uh, and I thank uh, Dr. Purnamita also, I had questions to be asked on mapping the vulnerabilities and education and awareness, and she has appropriately covered those points. So sector-specific vulnerability. And also different human-specific, maybe gender-specific, maybe age-specific, maybe economic status-specific vulnerabilities. And also based on their housing and economic conditions, they have to be mapped. Thresholds impacting their uh, the motility and morbidity need to be established for uh, any effective heat health early warning system. And then information needs to be sent to them. So that brings us to the next question of, and also information, IMD is doing a good service, but is the information designed uh, for the end users? Are the, it is, is it in their language? Is it under, is it to interpret? Is it to act upon? Those are real big questions. So, with that question, I come to Professor Rupa Kumar Kohli. Uh, sir, your take on co-design, co-production, co-delivery of uh, customized information. And also, I would uh, request how uh, the national framework, which IMD is going to put in place, and you have been a good guide to that, how that framework can help uh, in the overall heat management system in the country. Sir. Thank you. It's a very tough question, but I'll try to uh, respond. Uh, actually, I go back to this uh, famous word, heat action plan. Uh, heat is there always, and it is increasing, and plants are also there. We have volumes of plants uh, on the shelves. Uh, but I think the key word is actually action. Uh, when you say action, you have to actually identify the actors. Uh, I think we, we also heard about the need for governance and urban planners or uh, urban governance, etc. But I think we forgot the most important actor, that is the real people who are actually affected. So what are the actions that actually we can uh, assign to individuals? See, we are heat, heat wave or extreme heat is not something new that we are not familiar with. We, we, People are familiar with heat waves. And in fact, uh, if I can take some time to give you an anecdote, uh, 60 years back, when I was a small boy, uh, our school in summer, just before the heat season starts, suddenly shifts its timings, used to shift its timing up uh, to start at 7 o'clock and end at 11. So you go home and then uh, enjoy for the rest of the day. This was 60 years back. And in the morning, early morning, my grandmother used to give me, give us uh, for breakfast, just curd rice with a little bit of dry ginger mixed in it. So that means we had the capability traditionally to cope with heat. Uh, in fact, I also give you another anecdote. Uh, our Prime Minister, I had the opportunity to attend a meeting in Ahmedabad when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat. Uh, while inaugurating uh, a, a conference on climate services, he gave uh, a very important message which is still in my mind. That is, the modern society is based on controlling nature. If it is hot outside, you find an air conditioner and cool. If it is cold outside, you find a heater and uh, so you try to control nature. That is the modern uh, society is developing in that way. You have glass buildings and all that. But 
our ancient our traditional uh, society they were trying to live with in harmony with nature so in that process they a tremendous amount of traditional knowledge has accumulated and in our mad rush for modernizing we have discarded most of the traditional knowledge and uh, as if it is outdated so what is required is that we have to revisit those traditional approaches and use our modern knowledge advanced in, uh, understanding to actually see what is valid today and what is not valid today and this was the message the prime minister gave us almost 15 years back uh, i think in that sense i think today we had uh, a lot of discussion but there was very little i think rajshri referred to traditional knowledge uh, in passing but i think it needs uh, uh, a good focus to actually to go back to those traditional approaches to deal with key and this actually can be given as an action to the people to actually you actually don't need a forecast we we have a well defined heat season and if you have a no regrets policy you can actually ap apply all these traditional approaches irrespective of whether the forecast is uh, for an extreme heat or not so uh, to some extent you are protected so i think that that is one aspect that we have to uh, inculcate into the uh, uh, people's way of uh, coping with heat uh, the other is about uh, uh, the co production uh, and uh, uh, co development uh, in this also i think we need to uh, bring people into the picture uh, in fact we had lot of papers today uh, but there was very little discussion about the real temperature experienced by people near their communities and in their homes uh, around their immediate surroundings because what temperature data that we have is in the observatory which is in the open area somewhere uh, which may not reflect the real temperature people are experiencing so we can actually uh, find ways uh, for people to be also involved in uh, measuring immediate uh, thermal Uh, conditions in their surroundings uh, for example if you take pune that we have so many societies why not every society uh, have a, a, a an inexpensive uh, thermo thermal sensor uh, that can record the temperatures uh, using some standardized procedures and then find a way to consolidate all that and have uh, temperatures with a much higher resolution within the uh, city which can give us a better idea of where the real vulnerability exists and we can actually direct action there so that is where uh, i think uh, there is one way of co uh, participating in the observational practices and uh, co co producing that information that is required and uh, uh, additionally uh, in terms of the national framework for climate services i think uh, that is an excellent mechanism for all the uh, stakeholders from observational observations and monitoring and research we have not only iitm there are many other research groups are uh, on different aspect not only in climate in economic assessment health as impact assessment applications of this information communication there are so many ways so i think we need to find ways to bring all these stakeholders into a common platform through the nfcs where uh, we can actually agree to work together in a consistent and uh, come using a common framework because we have to speak the same language or if people start speaking in different languages we will not be able to follow each other so that nfcs actually provides that opportunity but for the nfcs to be successful it should have a high level governance i think that is where uh, we need to emphasize i think this was also discussed in the consultation that we had a few months back it should have a high level governance and it should be part of the national mission on climate change uh, then only it can actually uh, get the support that, that it requires at all levels so i think uh, uh, sorry for taking a lot of time giving anecdotes and all but that is how i feel i think the uh, uh, the upscaling should happen to all levels including the uh, highest uh, level from the prime minister up to the uh, people on the street thank you thank you sir any comments uh, from the audience yeah please 
Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. so uh, it's relevant, but maybe a little off topic. So we've been talking about heat all day. And um, I was thinking about like the root cause, which is greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I was curious about, um, you know, what, where does India stand when it comes to contributing greenhouse gas emissions, given it's a developing country and we have, you know, our priority is development and we do see, uh, you know, new developments happening every day. Um, so, you know, heat is, is an issue and uh, carbon dioxide is the reason why, you know, a lot of it is happening. Um, so I guess I was just curious about what India as a country can do like moving forward. As you mentioned, you know, we have to work with nature, not against it. So when we're doing all of these developments, uh, is environment a priority? Is it not? I was just curious on what your thoughts are, because, you know, the panels of experts. So just wanted to pose that question. Thank you. If uh, there is anybody to take this question, if not, uh, I will have to take it. Uh, say, as far as emissions are concerned, your first concern is very valid. But if you see per capita emissions, you probably have the data. If I don't have the figures, we are far below many of the countries. And the government has taken up uh, uh, the measures, to, uh, mitigation measures, a very large scale. Uh, we are probably now at number three now in terms of renewable energy across the world. And soon uh, India would be at number one in terms of generation of uh, the renewable energy that would bring down the carbon emissions. There's a big plan of Ministry of uh, Climate, uh, this environment, forest, climate change of greening the buildings. It's, uh, I think, one billion square feet area of the buildings to be made green. And uh, I think uh, three-fourths or two-thirds work of that has gone. Uh, government is encouraging use of EVs in a big way. Uh, so efforts are seriously being taken at, at the federal level and also at the level of the states. That shows uh, the commitment and engagement of the political authorities in the country. That, that is a very positive aspect. If the political bosses are inclined towards something, that happens. A country, I feel, is on a right path. Uh, the space can be accelerated, of course, that we should do. And all the efforts are on uh, various, you know, action plans. Uh, the Ministry of Health has come out with a national plan for human health, climate change and human health. They are addressing various health issues. Uh, the 10 missions of the Prime Minister, uh, at least four of those missions uh, have dedicated component for climate change, addressing the issue of climate change. Uh, so the government is very well aware of uh, all the ministries, department. They are contributing uh, their bit to all those combined efforts. Hope our contribution, India's contribution to minimizing greenhouse gas emissions would be tremendous in coming days. And it will be well appreciated in the country. I hope so. Let's all hope so. and this heat health interact given the theme of this top of today's um, discussions so as I think through clearly reducing pollution has various pathways with reducing heat exposure both indoors and outdoors so if you consider reducing and has mitigation uh, implications with short-lived climate pollutants. And we know that we are very actively trying to pursue a reducing pollution, pollution prevention path now. So that's one pathway. The second thing I would say is about urban green, greening urban infrastructure. So greening urban infrastructure again has very many positive externalities with health and heat. The third thing I can think of, um, let me just see, I was just remembering. The third thing I was thinking of was um, the, even in terms of 
reducing deforestation. And there are multiple health benefits and heat-related benefits from reducing deforestation, which is again, and actively pursuing afforestation, which is part of India's commitment in its NDC towards building the carbon sink, and which is also being actively pursued by various states. So, and the fourth one I want to talk about again is renewable energy with the implications for heat and health. And this comes out of direct observation in three states of India from my field work, where renewable energy supplies have been very important in ensuring OPD services at health centers. So you have these solar panels coming up, renewable energy sources being used very proactively in states like Karnataka, Andhra, Maharashtra, and in some places, and other state places, where you are at Odisha, West Bengal now, where actively this is being seen as the pathway towards ensuring that you have your coal chain in place, you're able to maintain your coal chain, you're able to maintain 24 seven electricity. So what I'm saying is that there are these interconnections through multiple pathways for mitigation and adaptation which have implications for heat and health. And this is what I was thinking through. The fifth one is that India has actively said that it would now get into this whole thing of greening the pharma and the medical chains, supply chains, right? Now, pharma, hospital care, greening it is again a very big deal for this. I don't know if it answers your question, but it clearly gives me pathways along which we can we are proceeding and i think india has been fairly active in at least stating its intent and trying to pursue it we'll get there hopefully thank you dr pulmita thank you that at least partly replies to your queries and another initiative which i had forgotten is a tremendous amount of research has gone into direct seeded paddy versus the puddle paddy and uh, results are very encouraging. Uh, the government, the, the ministries and departments of agriculture are promoting a direct seeded rice to a great extent because the pa paddies are big source of methane emissions. So that, that action is also being taken. So country looks at tripath. path, maybe you can well say we, we need to run faster along that path. Sure, everybody recognize that. Uh, so I thank my uh, fellow panelists. And But before we conclude it, it's important that how this you can take we, the program is still on please reserve it for the end maybe uh, it's important that how these information are being taken to the people so media is a big stakeholder uh, for taking the information to the people and uh, i think i we have nidhi uh, who presented if she can comment on how best uh, what are the shortcomings and how can we modify our delivery system to make it more effective your take on that, Nidhi. You can take this. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think regarding media perspective, uh, since yesterday we've been uh, hearing and looking at uh, fascinating presentations with a lot of data, maps, and everything. Uh, the real challenge is that a lot of times this conversation becomes like talking to each other. Uh, we are already talking to people who are already converts. Uh, the whole challenge is how do you take it out to people? And that's where the whole role of media comes in. And I strongly believe that in um, uh, you know events like this or anything which is to do with meteorology or science it's very important to involve journalists uh, like you know i've been going through uh, the presentations that were made today i've made my notes these are wonderful stories because journalists don't understand a lot of journalists don't understand the kind of data that is presented and all we are interested in stories we are interested in human interest stories uh, so I think that's where there is still a gap between the scientific community and the media. And I think um, uh, climate change is a huge challenge for everybody, but it also gives us a window of opportunity because 
climate change has started affecting everybody there is no one who's not facing the impact which is why people are also interested in it now there was a time two decades back when i started off as an environment journalist it was very difficult for me to sell an environment story or uh, you know sell a climate story or a climate equity story but now every day we are living climate change it's easier for us to publish those stories but we also need inputs uh, from the scientific community so that uh, we can continue reporting on it and writing about it. That's, I think, one point I would want to make. The second point around, because we're talking of heat waves, I would want to say uh, two things. A lot of conversation around heat waves today that I've attended is all very urban centric. I've been reporting only from rural India. And unfortunately, we talk of rural India and heat waves only when people die in rural India. Like last year, Balia people died and then suddenly everybody wakes up to, uh, you know, heat uh, being a problem in, um, rural, in rural India. Otherwise, whatever studies or models and all that were presented were mainly urban thing. We talk of urban heat island effect and all. Not saying that urban is not a challenge, uh, but two out of three Indians still live in rural India. So I think it's very important for us to not forget rural India and not remind be reminded of rural India only when people you know die there um, and also regarding heat waves I think we have oversold Ahmedabad heat action plan I've been attending a lot of these meetings where everybody talks of heat action and all presentations only talk of Ahmedabad now if I as a journalist want to report on it you know my editor would tell me yaar Ahmedabad ke lawa kuch nahi hai kya is desh mein so, you know, it becomes difficult for me to sell a story because are we saying that in this country, we only have Ahmedabad, like from 2010, we are only talking about it. So it's important. Again, it brings me back to the first point that there's so much of research, there's so much of work happening. How, how does it reach media so that it also reaches people? So I think we need more examples beyond Ahmedabad now whenever we talk of heat action plans. I guess Jodhpur has a very good plan. I mean, that's what I've heard. Telangana is doing a lot of uh, good work on roofs and all. Uh, so I think we should also include all that. And the last point for, uh, maybe to Indian Meteorological Society, I think if uh, it's possible for you guys to have some kind of a regular media training program like you know you have this two or three days conclave with researchers and scientific community uh, if you could have something like that on a regular basis with journalists also involving vernacular journalists i think it will do a commence uh, service to this whole issue of climate change communication that's all thank you thank you very much nidhi thank you any comment on this after that we go to the question at here comment or you want to add something to the forecast communication? Yeah, please, Rajiv. In terms of communicating uh, the heat uh, related action plan, like what we are now talking about, Arvan, you are right. But uh, as a scientist, uh, science does not differentiate between urban and rural. All products are generated everywhere. One important problem we face is the verification of the result or whether the feedback of the result. That if we find somewhere a heat wave is there, who is going to tell me that uh, it is, yes, it was there. Somebody has to look the product or somewhere the media or some people from the community. So the community engagement in terms of rural India is really missing for heat wave uh, actions. In urban, it is always reported by Twitter. This thing, we can have very little effort as a forecaster. We can get it. But the community engagement for heat wave is really we have to go ahead in long term. But I agree with you. The products are there, but it is uh, how to get to them and how what they're feeling, how we get it so that next week we will be better forecasting. That is uh, missing from our side. Thank you, Rajiv and the young lady here. Uh, sir, regarding what uh, Kohli sir said earlier, so uh, you asked like uh, thermal sensors placing in like uh, different societies and getting high resolution information regarding the temperature and all. So, and many people already told that this high resolution data uh, or observation data sets are required. So, my question is that if we 
get those high resolution data sets in some way like if there are some so there will be like patches of small small patches of regions there will be high temperatures there will be low there will be rainfall so are we now like scientifically equipped to explain those uh, process that whether this is happening due to some particular uh, like physical phenomena something is driving this uh, small scale variability and how uh, without that scientific understanding like how we can proceed to forecasting in that small uh, scale thank you the right person is uh, before us luckily professor rajshri she would respond to it uh i mean i don't know whether you were there for my presentation we have something close to 18 uh, stations throughout nagpur the idea was uh, in urban planning you cannot you have to look at smaller parcels the idea is that the urban is not one single entity that is accepted there is no need to prove it because you will have a lake you will have a green area you will have a slum you will have an old city you will have a high rise uh, locality and all of them have their own microclimate i will not talk too much about wind because uh, that's really very difficult to catch also capture also so but there is a variation in the temperature and uh, when you talk about the temperatures in urban areas uh, there are a couple of things that contribute to it in addition to the overall meteorology that one is talking about i will not talk about that so it is one is the uh, so there are three components one is your urban surface the surface uh, uh, properties second is what kind of roughness you have and that means what kind of urban form is there and third and most importantly the amount of anthropogenic heat that you have in that area and in anthropogenic heat you have uh, from electricity the electricity that is being used by people the population density and the third thing is the anthropogenic heat from the traffic so once i get all this i mean what is the application of that once i get all this i understand that as a planner if i am planning the city for next if there is going to be a change redevelopment of some area what kind of i can anticipate what kind of change will it have on temperature in that area and accordingly in uh, you can start planning the mitigation measures in advance and if you are not if the someone you can even have a variable taxing uh, you can start putting tax on people i mean one can go to any extent i will not talk about them because they are not very popular measures because it is because of the people who live in that area and they decided to have that kind of development that's why there is the, that kind of microclimate has been has been evolved so one can even take that approach and that has been that helps a lot in developing mitigation measures in taking measures in term of terms of how to address vulnerability in reducing risk uh, so if as a lo uh, urban local body if i have 100 rupees or even as a state if i have 100 rupees i know exactly where i should invest those 100 rupees in which area so i am not in the dark in terms of what to do and i can then later on then i can again assess the vulnerability maybe next time it is i mean next time you evaluate it it is reduced so that that's how it helps i hope i answered your question and if you couple it with the forecasting models that you have i i forgot to mention that but if you start modeling the cities at that scale and start forecasting and modeling then i one can even forecast land use land cover because you already have a plan for 25 years you put that you see what kind of changes would occur and make changes in the your development strategies i think that takes care of the question that ma'am had regarding development and environment so science can help a lot certainly thank you dr thank you very much dr rupa yeah can you add to that point? to and respond to lakshmi i understand your point about uh the sensors being influenced by immediate heat source which can actually uh, you know, uh kind of make the representativeness very narrow so in this context what we need to do is uh provide guidance for locating these sensors within whatever locality that we choose uh, at what height it is to be done 
and where it, it can be installed. For example, if somebody installs it on the top of a kitchen stove, uh, so that's no longer valid. So that kind of guidance we, can, we have to provide to standardize that exposure. The other and most important thing is collecting the metadata. They have to document the metadata. So once you have the metadata and a standardized installation, uh, I think it should be fairly easy to work out uh, the patterns and eliminate uh, 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 these uh, extraneous forcings on the uh, thermal environment. But at the same time, it will provide us uh, an indicator of the exact thermal uh, environment that people are living in uh, that can give us a better idea of what response actions that can be taken. Thank you, sir. So it's a problem after we get the model output. We have to assume that there the, is the output of the models, but underneath that there is an urban geometry. So structure of that geometry, the construction material used for that, and also the waste heat generated in different localities. Uh, are the parameters they need to be monitored and if you know how is the structure spread over the Pune city the model outputs then can be interpreted which of the areas would be warmer by what what magnitude and accordingly the actions can be initiated maybe long-term actions and maybe immediate actions if there is a threat so it's a mix of science and society and urban planning and actions on this way. thank you Lakshmi thank you very much uh, any other comment question so if not any, uh, I would really thank all my fellow panelists here, uh, starting with Dr. Krishnan, Dr. Rupa Kumar Kohli, Professor Mukherjee, Das Gupta, I'm sorry, <laughs> and uh, Dr. Raj Siri there. Uh, and I hope uh, somebody has noted down uh, the views uh, given by uh, the panelists there or it's being recorded. So from there, it should find way in some of our uh, recommendations. So with the points which emerge, we need to, I very brief notes what I could take while sitting here, that impacts and vulnerability needs to be mapped, thresholds need to be established. Various indices to convert the, you know, meteorological information into impact indices need to be made. and threshold of those indices based on actual impact on the human beings, on their health, on their economic uh, aspects of their livelihood needs to be quantified. And then focus need to be communicated in terms of those thresholds. Uh, likely to exceed what action should you take? And that also can guide us uh, for longer term actions to be taken for mitigation purposes uh, and also for adaptation. Uh, Probably we need to work on observation data in addition to the gridded data. Uh, uh, Dr. Krishnan very rightly pointed out that some of the information is lost while we grid the data. Uh, those extremes particularly are moderated. Attribution studies are really important. We need to carry those out. And uh, for economic impacts, we need to probably a number of studies uh, through various economic pathways leading to actions and then reactions and then final impacts and everything every step has got economic implications those, those need to be quantified uh, uh, so that necessary actions and the, probably uh, those impacts need to be projected also in future taking the projections uh, uh, of the climate models so impacts can also be projected so that uh, the plans can be accordingly put in place capacity building is important uh, this is one aspect, awareness, education, capacity building. If, if you have to do one activity, let's do that. So unless a user is aware, he is capable to take actions, he knows the impacts, uh, probably all our efforts would be negated by that one action. So that we should assign top priority. And that can start with media, as Nidhi proposed. Uh, uh, I think uh, Pune office would be doing something, Nidhi, for this region at least. And all IMD has got offices in almost all state capitals. We should do that. And user engagement uh, is really important uh, because information is to be used by them. So it needs to be you know, designed as per their requirement. Should be easy to interpret, sent through a medium which they have access to. Uh, WhatsApp has become very popular nowadays and maybe other social media 
uh, but if somebody expert on that, I think we have about 50% of the population has got access to smartphones, nearly 50, maybe a percentage or two less than that. And in rural areas, it is even less. So that aspect need to be taken into consideration. We, we try to send everything through WhatsApp and internet and mobile. Uh, so the facilities available to the users need to be taken into consideration. Uh, and uh, Dr. Rupa Kumar very rightly pointed out, we need to identify actors, actors at different levels up to the last person who has to take action. Their role need to be very well defined. Written in a document, heat action plan, somebody pointed out there are many, uh, but those action plans also are needed with roles and responsibility. And an auto rolling system has to be there in the country. You know, if something happens, a person who or she, he or she is expected to take, take an action because of virtue of his or her position, that action should start automatically. That kind of system needs to be put in place. And our traditional knowledge, uh, Dr. Rupa Kumar very rightly pointed out, they need to be brought out, evaluated in present context, if applicable, should be applied. And then FCS, uh, of course, is important, but that needs a governing structure. Uh, it's important to take benefit of the climate services, unless it is structured, stakeholders involved, uh, in fact, uh, the impact will not be as good as they are expected to be, or they could be. There is a gap between media and scientists that needs to be bridged. And I, I fully agree with Nidhi that rural areas I need more attention. I myself belonging to rural areas. They are largely, you know, neglected in this discourse of heat, at least. It leads to a lot of fire in rural areas during uh, because of hot weather and during heat wave periods. People do get sickness, maybe the local remedies are helping them, maybe their impacts are not reported, neither to media nor to hospitals, they are somehow being locally managed. So they need to be uh, within our radar as good as the urban areas also. And high resolution data sets need to be you know, generated over urban areas uh, for heat island mapping and also so that then those areas can be identified, actions can be taken at that end. So I thank all of you very much, and I thank my fellow panelists very much. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Uh, a very uh, big thanks to all our panelists of uh, this session, and also the audience to uh, interact, uh, actively interact on it. So. <clears throat> I request uh, all the dignitaries present on the dais to be here only as we are going towards our very directory session of uh, this uh, national symposium. So before going uh, to, uh, to the prize distribution, firstly, we would like to felicitate our uh, committee for uh, the evaluation of the presenters. So for that, uh, first, I would like to request Dr. Samir Pokhrel from IITM Pune. Please come forward. There were total six members in this committee. Next is uh, Dr. G. K. Savai Sarjay from IMD Pune. Dr. Medha Deshpande from IITM Pune. Dr. Prashant Pillai from IITM Pune. And then Dr. Sizo Zakaria from IMD Pune. As during the previous uh, session, uh, one of our presenters was not there. So uh, for that, <clears throat> once again, I request Ms. Ayushi Tandon from University of Petroleum and Energy Studies to please come forward.
So after this felicitation, now we are uh, going to uh, give the certificate, memento and cash prizes to all our winners. So we start from, uh, we are having total six prizes, the two for third position and two for second and two for first. So we start from third prize. So third prize, first third prize goes to Anokha Shilin. This topic was heat stress hazard mapping inside to a novel approach. Next third prize is Anurag Chaudhary. You all are requested to please come forward. Anurag Chaudhary, topics relation between meridional mass transport and temperature patterns, insights from observations. For sex, uh, the second prize goes to Miss Neetu Tyagi, shifting of the zone of occurrence of extreme weather event heat waves. Next, second prize goes to Somdeep, and the topic is heat wave and its collateral impact and mitigation. <laughs> so the cash prize of 3000 for the winners the take the position third and 4000 for uh, second position and 5000 for first position so for first position the first um, the prize goes to zor tukaram chandrakan and the topic is assessing the impact of sub seasonal tropical oscillations on heat stress over the indian region The next first prize goes to Ms. Lakshmi and the topic was observed intensification of moist heat stress over the Indian region. Please have a big round of applause, all the winners of these presentations during the National Symposium. I'm thankful to all the dignitaries, so you all can have a seat. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir, please. And this anchor or compare who or you call it for the last two days has been tremendous service. Uh, needs an applause from audience. <laughs> Dr. Well done. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now I would like uh, I would like to invite Dr. Archana Rai from IATM Pune to propose an official vote of thanks. Thank you, Arshaji. Uh, Good evening to all of you. On behalf of IMSP, IITM, IMD, I would like to thank all the participants, IMSP members, senior scientists, students for their active participation in making this event successful. I would like to thank all the EC members of IMS Pune chapter and National Council members who have supported for this event. We are thankful to all committee members and volunteers for their tremendous efforts in making this event successful. We are grateful to LIP team, GA section and computer division for making arrangements for today's event. I also thanks all the industries and institutes who have supported for this event. I once again, thanks to all of you and next year, <laughs> hope we will have a good uh, workshop as well as some symposium on an another subject. Thanks to all of you.